I have to be on my phone, you guys, so no video. No, no problem. Just checking. I didn't get to chime in quick enough on the yay. That's okay. I might be doing it again if we weren't live streamed. If you could just give me a minute to take my mute button off when you when you vote, because I can't always get to it fast enough. Okay. We are live, no Madam Mayor. We are live. Great. Thank you. We'll do this again. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the regular planning meeting. I'm going to open up the meeting and read the resolution for the meeting to begin. Be it resolved that the meeting be called to order and that the agenda be, for the meeting be adopted as circulated. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Link. Seconded, Councillor Buschetti. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed? And that is carried. Thank you. We have no addendums to the agenda for this evening. I will read the invocation. Please bow your heads. Please grant the Council of West St. Paul the wisdom and leadership in guiding our community for the future. We ask for support in fostering an environment that promotes understanding of good governance and respect on the issues we are undertaking in our roles as municipal leaders. Our goal is to grow and be successful as a community and individuals. Amen. All right, thank you. So we have two public hearings uh, for the meeting this evening. Before I begin, I just want to go around and introduce council members. We might have a few more viewers this evening um, with public hearings. Um, Ward 1 Councillor, Councillor Link. And we have Councillor for Ward 2 in attendance, Councillor Buschetti. Councillor for Ward 3, Councillor Cliver, is joining us on the phone this evening. Hello. And we have Councillor Prague for Ward 4, our CAO, Mr. Olnick. And West St. Paul Administration is our Municipal Legislative Officer, Ms. Shaw. And we have David Patton, our planner from Red River Planning with us this evening. Thank you, Mr. Patton. All right, and sorry, the Executive Director of Red River Planning, Jennifer Ferguson, I see that you're with us as well. Thank you for joining us tonight. All right, before we begin the planning items for this evening, um, because there are some that may not participate in here, how our process goes, I'm going to read out an introduction to our public hearings. We are aware that most people who attend or view our council meetings for planning matters, like the ones here tonight, are not completely familiar with how the planning process works. I wanna spend a few minutes providing some additional context so that we all have a better understanding of the process, the requirements around the, municip around the Manitoba Planning Act and our local bylaws. Any person can apply for a variance, conditional use, rezoning or subdivision as per the Manitoba Planning Act. By making the application with West St. Paul's Planning Authority, the Red River Planning District, this does not mean that council has endorsed the planning item. When an application is submitted, council is required to hear from the applicant and from those representatives who attend the public hearing to speak in favor, in opposition, or for more information. It is important to note that council is being presented with all the information at the same time as those in attendance here today. There are procedures council members must follow once an application is officially filed with the Red River Planning District and until such time as a decision is made. Council members cannot speak with the applicant or any other person who may be seeking information or who wants to speak in support or opposition to an open application. This guards against anyone influencing council members before the public hearing and ensures each member of council makes their decision based on the same information heard or presented by way of correspondence here tonight. Often residents are frustrated by not being able to speak to their elected officials once the application has been filed, but this is done for these reasons. The Red River Planning District staff can, however, answer questions from the public at any time. The Red River Planning District accept, accepts applications from residents and developers who want to build houses, sheds, swimming pools, garages, decks, etc., and from those who want to subdivide their lands from one lot splits to larger subdivisions. Red River Planning District staff are professional planners recognized by a professional association and are tasked with researching every application. Their work and recommendations to council are made based on a legal framework and not personal opinions. They review each application against the Manitoba Planning Act, our development plan and our zoning bylaw. They also circulate the application to many other organizations that may be impacted, such as Manitoba Infrastructure, the Public Schools, Finance Board, Sustainable Development, Gas, Hydro, adjacent municipalities, such as the City of Winnipeg, East St. Paul, Rockwood, to name a few. 
Red River Planning District does not does this to determine if the applicant meets application meets all the legal requirements. At public hearings, council hears from many delegations and we will ultimately decide if the application is a good fit for the community and if it will be approved. We consider both the legal requirements the planner has researched as well as feedback from our community. I wanna briefly discuss the process and conduct during the public hearings. To begin a public hearing, a resolution is read to open the public hearing. Our planner begins by presenting information from his report as well as his recommendation to council. Council members can then ask questions for clarification through the chair. We will then hear from the applicant followed by those who have registered to speak in favor, those opposed, and those who have registered for information. At the end of these presentations, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond. At that time, no new information can be presented. Council members have an opportunity to ask questions for clarification to the applicant and anyone registered to speak on the planning items. All questions must be made through the chair as per our procedural bylaw. We have many people who have taken the time to register to speak and it is our goal to hear from each and every one of you tonight. So I would ask each person be as concise as possible in their comments, restrict those comments to only the application before us. If your position or the information that you wanna share with council is the same as other speakers who have spoken before you, you can indicate this by highlighting key points of your argument. Lastly, we wanna provide a respectful setting for all those who wish to be heard here tonight, regardless of their position on the matter. Respectful conduct means no interruptions during the, the process. I would ask that people please have your uh, microphones on mute while others are speaking. Um, we wanna ensure for a respectful environment. And those are all of the comments I have regarding the planning, the public hearing process. So we are at item 5.1. We will open the first public hearing. Be it resolved that this meeting of council recess for the purpose of holding a public hearing pursuant to section 105 of the Planning Act. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Link, seconded Councillor Prague. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed, carry. Thank you. And I will turn it over to you, Mr. Planner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Bear with me a moment here while I share my screen. Thank you. So the first application before you tonight is conditional use number 44 of 2020. This is to allow a manufacturing and sales use, uh, more specifically the assembly of spas and saunas at 835 Capitalist Drive. This property is zone CH uh, Highway Commercial. And see the uh, the property is located on the north side of Capitalist Drive. It's approximately 1.7 acres in size, and it has been developed with a commercial building, which is not shown on this aerial photo, uh, but it is shown on the applicant's site plan here. Uh, now, as you can see, um, Capitalist Drive on this uh, on this site plan is to the right of the image. That existing building that I mentioned is uh, is closest to Capitalist Drive. The applicant closing a second building on the property. Uh, which would house the proposed so Northern Lights Cedar Tubs Incorporated uh, currently operates a retail and warehousing use uh, from the existing building. Occupancy was issued uh, earlier this year for that use. As I mentioned, they're proposing a second main building. This would be 4,350 square feet in size, uh, in which to assemble spas and saunas, as opposed to selling a flat uh, pack, do it yourself, uh, unassembled kits to customers. Um, so the assembly um, use would consist of assembling these spas and saunas, uh, as opposed to, again, selling just the materials to the, the customers. Uh, the proposed building complies with all the bulk regulations of the zoning bylaw, for example, setbacks uh, from property lines. Uh, but the manufacturing or assembly component of the use does require conditional use approval, and that is why the application is before Council this evening. Uh, I do want to note that similar uses, for example, cabinet manufacturing, are permitted in the zone without conditional use approval. Um, so cabinet manufacturing is specifically listed as permitted in the zone. Uh, this type of assembly wouldn't uh, fall under that category, however, and so again, uh, conditional use would be required. Um, since the report was written, the applicant has submitted some additional information. Uh, the hours of operation for the assembly aspect of the business would be 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, the applicant expects uh, two to three uh, additional employees will be added for the assembly aspect of the business and no manufacturing equipment other than light tools such as electric drills uh, will be used in the assembly process. 
just want to quickly go through the applicants uh, building plans again this is for the proposed building which would house the assembly use as you can see uh, most of the floor area is dedicated to assembly there's a parts storage area uh, proposed as well as an office these are section uh, drawings of the proposed building as well uh, finally, from the applicant, we have the uh, photos that have been provided showing some of the assembly process. Again, um, that process would not involve any equipment other than light tools, such as electric drills. Uh, and finally, these are some photos of the, uh, the subject property showing that existing building. Uh, again, that's, uh, uh, that houses the existing retail and warehousing use. So council can add any conditions of approval deemed necessary to ensure the use is compatible with the area and will not negatively uh, affect other properties in the area. So some other conditions that council has added to similar manufacturing type uses uh, along capitalists have been uh, restricted hours of operation uh, and a requirement that any assembly or manufacturing takes place within an enclosed building. And so that latter uh, example uh, has been included uh, as a condition uh, for council's consideration. Should council approve a conditional use order, the following conditions are recommended. First, that conditional use approval be limited to allow assembly of spas and saunas as proposed. Um, second, that the applicant obtain all required permits. And third, that all manufacturing slash assembly associated with the business shall occur within an enclosed building. That is all I have for this application, uh, Madam Mayor, and of course, we welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Planner. I'll go around the virtual council table here and start with Councillor Link. Any questions for the planner? Hi. Hi, Mr. Planner. Actually, I emailed Mr. Planner my questions ahead of time, but I will share with Council the main question. The others were all related to the main question. Uh, I was wondering why this building was considered a second main building rather than an accessory building as per Table 1, uh, a building necessary for the operation of the primary use? And the answer was, <laughs> our office is considering it as a main building because it is introducing a new use, which is assembly, uh, that is beyond the scope of what is taking place in the existing main building, which is retail and warehouse associated. Uh, the proposed assembly use is beyond the scope of what is typically considered an accessory use. So I'm satisfied with that answer and I have no other questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Pat. Thank you, Councillor Link, for sharing that with us. Councillor Bichetti, any questions for the planner? Yes, uh, you're saying that this they have an uh, occupancy permit already? They do. So um, the CCANs, well, you can see them in the upper picture there. Those aren't allowed. So how is it, you know, is it the uh, are those temporary? Was it just to move stuff in? Just wondering that kind of stuff? That would be a question for the applicant. Um, you were correct in thinking that if they are permanently located there, um, they would require um, conditional use approval from council as well. So there's nothing for exterior storage on this application that I've seen. So is there just? No, this application would not encompass uh, containers or any type of exterior storage. This is uh, solely uh, to allow the assembly uh, process as described in the, in the new building. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cliver, any questions for Mr. Patton? Mr. Patton, can you show me the backyard? Do you have any photos of that? I do not have any photos of the, uh, of the backyard. These are the only photos um, of the property. Do you know how much space is back there as far because I can't you're drawing a drawing is a drawing I just trying to get a um, an understanding of how much square footage there would be back there to put a building up and how much uh, room there would be to drive something back there that kind of thing. So sure. I'm just taking a look at the applicant site plan here. Um, why was the um, why did the applicant uh, not add on to the building rather than create a whole new building? That would be a question uh, for, for the yeah. applicant. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so it looks like between the two buildings, there would be roughly um, 200 feet. Um, 
and behind the proposed building would be um, uh, 66 feet uh, as uh, shown on the site plan. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clyburn. Councillor Prag, any questions for Mr. Patton? No questions for Mr. Patton. Thank you. I just have one question, a follow-up really to Councillor Buschetti's questions in terms of the um, exterior storage slash storage containers. Um, I know in your report, you said that council can choose to add any conditions necessary. Are we able to add a condition that um, all but one storage container needs to be removed and anything outside for exterior storage would need to be removed? Are we able to add that as a condition? What I would suggest um, as a condition uh, which would accomplish the similar uh, thing would be to re require a, a letter of clearance from the RM uh, okay. from, and that would indicate that the property is in compliance. So before um, the RM could issue that, of course, uh, the property would have to be brought into compliance and so the, um, the containers or any exterior storage that is occurring would have to be uh, addressed. Um, so that's, uh, um, that's uh, what I would recommend in terms of a condition that could address those. Thank you. I guess a follow up question is if it is the will of Council, once we hear from uh, the applicant and, and uh, residents or adjoining properties that are wanting to comment on it, if it's the will of Council to allow this conditional use, um, and we dealt with the container issue, it would save the applicant coming back forward for another conditional use on a storage container. Um, so if Council was wanting to deal with something like that now, so that somebody isn't having to go through this process, is that possible or it would have to go through the process? Unfortunately, that wasn't advertised. Um, there was no indication when the applicant applied that there were containers on the property. So those aren't included in, or, uh, in this application. So they couldn't be dealt with. Uh, um, of course, as I mentioned, uh, you could require a letter of clearance, which would uh, require them to address it somehow. I think that would be a good addition for a condition. That's something that we've typically done. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I have. Ms. Elias, do we have the applicant on the line? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I believe we have Dan Jung available with us. Sorry, I couldn't hear his last name. It's hard to hear you, Miss Elias. Uh, Dan Jung. Jung, thank you. Mr. Jung, are you there? Mr. Jung, are you there? We just need a moment, Madam Mayor, for Mr. Jung to unmute. Uh, we have been given permission to. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Jung. Oh, thank you for that unmute tip. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, I think um, Mr. Planner uh, has explained the usage of the building. Uh, part of the problem we ran into was the the build cycle planning to where we are now was a three year period. And in that three year, the growth exceeded the forecasted growth. So we are at a stage where um, we had to actually hold back what we traditionally do, which was offer a customer two choices. You could have a wooden hot tub as a package kit where you assemble it or you could have a hot tub pre-assembled at the factory and we ship it out. Due to lack of space, um, we had to pause the, op the option to offer the pre-assembled. And um, as the three years went by, we then were in the position as we finished this building, we realized we needed more space than we actually built. Um, so that is, what we had planned was to add the more space. Um, there were pretty much every building on the in the area it has two buildings on it. Um, so I I'm I'm not sure what what the actual requirements were, but um, our neighbor has two buildings, and the neighbor beside us is building two buildings. So um, as far as the sea cans, they were brought in for temporary storage. Um, 
until we can either build a new location somewhere else or or get this location um, done. We're just simply at maximum capacity and uh, um, the options of renting someplace off site, you know, just the logistics of, of every day trying to to send a truck to pick things up um, doesn't make it conducive to business. So we've applied for this to um, uh, this extra space in order to move out um, the manufacturing into there, freeing up a lot of space to move the stuff in the containers into the property, the two properties, because some of it is used for manufacturing, such as wood storage and, and so forth. So um, I hope that addresses your questions on the containers, which um, I think that's about all I can tell you. It's, as I said, light manufacturing. It is carpentry, in my opinion. Uh, we use wood. It's not a, there's no fiberglass or machining. Um, we're assembling old-fashioned cooperage hot tubs. That's our business, as you've seen from the pictures. Uh, we take a floor. We make basically a big wine barrel is what we make. Um, wrap it up, package it, and ship it out. Great. Thank you. And, and on a positive, it's wonderful to see businesses in our community growing faster than they even anticipated. So uh, well done to you. Thank you. I'm going to go around and see if there are questions from Council for you. And I'll start with Councillor Buschetti. Any questions for Mr. Jung? Yes. Okay, thanks. First of all, thanks for coming out and putting this application in. And I'm glad to hear business is booming. And so the sea cans are just a temporary, like whatever you have out there would be adequately spaced in your, in that proposed new building? Correct. There's no plans for um, the C, the, there's no plans to continue sea cans. Um, it was just an overflow that, that started and uh, we have them on a rental program so we can, you know, the idea was as soon as we get some space done, the building put up, we would move everything and the sea cans would all be removed. Um, we don't like them any more than, than anybody else. I don't, you know, uh, it's just a, an evil necessity at this stage to transition from one to the other. Uh, given it's winter too, we can't keep a lot of this stuff outside. And I mean, the wood itself is, is very susceptible to moisture and rain, of course. So we have to protect it. And um, it's just where we are for an interim solution. And uh, one that makes economic sense and viable sense. Because I mean, as I said, to rent a place in the city absorb you know, substantial transportation costs and labor costs to constantly move things back and forth. Okay. And one more question. I see the building's got about a 10 foot, I believe it is. I'm just trying to blow up the drawing. It just kind of blurs up a bit to the back property line. And I'm just wondering, since you have all that other space in between the two buildings, would you be willing to move that towards the, the I guess, building number one, I'll call it, just to eliminate if there is any noise because there is eventually proposed residential happening to the other side of that fence so yeah i think um there's two two fences the property line has a fairly big buffer i can't see it either it's about a 40 foot buffer and then there's a small maybe 10 foot to the fence but the property line actually extends back the 40 foot where there is the fence line that extends that entire uh, uh, development so you're you're at 50 feet back to that fence line actually if you look at the plans the other issue we have is um if you are looking at the at the plan off of the main building you'll see that that sort of rectangle coming out is a loading dock um there's two loading docks for semi so the the radius of the semi they come in to the the uh, i guess uh north to the east is a driveway in and they have to be able to make a uh, roundabout turn. We also have our staff parking along along that area. So uh, we do, you know, we have upwards of uh, 20 staff, you know, so there's, there's vehicles there, but the main concern is these double semis having access to do a, a circle. And when the original plan was done, you know, it was based on how the a semi you know the space a semi needs so 
there's not much space left there. The, um, there, were, there is an existing fence line. I think you can see it, it's sort of the gray line. And that's really, the semis go right up to that gray line to do their turn. So, um, you know, with the 50 foot buffer to, that, to the fence, um, moving, you know, the designers of, of this had to consider that we have, we have to have that semi radius turn in here. So, um, well, you know, while I'm open to suggestions, this was sort of designed as the best case solution to our problem. Hey, thanks for that. I, I thought that was the, I thought the red line on the drawing was that um, wooden fence. So you're saying there's another 40 feet past your 10 foot boundary line, whatever you want to call it, behind the building. Correct. And that's been fenced off. So there's no, um, no, you know, no more access to it in terms of uh, no parking allowed there. No, you know, uh, no storage, no nothing. So um, that red, ex the, the red uh, shows the proposed extension to the fence. The gray line is the existing fence. Okay. So I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so I think we've put it in as close to, you know, tried to fit it in um, to all the requirements, also bearing in mind the fire ratings and all that that we have to comply with. So uh, um, uh, that was the best case so scenario is where it is. Okay, and just, I guess, one more thing. So you said the sea cans are going, and I guess yes. all the, the pallets and all that kind of stuff that are... I guess out there is storage right now because it's lack of space, I guess. So it's just being put out there. Or? Correct. We've, we've put a concrete um, uh, pad. The sea cans will be gone. The pallets that are, are used in the, in the shipping operation, they'll go um, up against, there's a spot for them right now. So they won't be visible by any means from the, the front side or back. I mean, I guess the, the side they would the West or, you know, the east side, but you'd have to be driving in through. So they're all in the back. And that's part of the, you know, they're neatly placed. We have four different sizes of tubs, four different sizes of pallets. So I understand that, but that's the exterior storage part of this. Like that's where we were, we, someone was asking about exterior storage, but that, that's where the applicant, the application doesn't have anything for exterior storage and that's considered exterior storage. Okay. I understand that now where you're coming from, counselor. Um, that should have been in the initial uh, application because that it was certainly part of our our manufacturing process is is having pallets to uh, load things on. So I didn't. Uh, the developer itself did the application. I'm I'm not too familiar with all the the processes. Well, I'm sure the planner can bring you up to speed after this because it's not on this application, so I won't go any farther with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kleiber, do you have any questions for Mr. Jung? Hi. Sorry. Um, no, actually, I think you answered the question because I was wondering how much space was there for turnaround. Uh, I figured that you'd probably have to have some kind of trucking back there to move the the um, product once it's completed. So you've answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Prague, any questions for Mr. Jung? Yes, Mr. Chung, um, at the back there, there'll be housing going at the back of your business. Do you know that? I do. I'm aware of that. Yep. Yes. And I'm positive you're going to put lighting at the back there. Am I correct? Um, lighting in the front for sure. I, uh, I, to be very honest, I haven't seen the electrical plans. It's a fairly minimal uh, um, construction build. So yeah. I don't know. Uh, there, there might be some lighting for security reasons because that, you know, it is accessible. Uh, um, so I, I would think we would we would go the design was standard building practices, but if that is that you know if that was an issue, we would have to address that in the electrical no, plan. 
No, no, it's not an nest show. It's just I don't want thing that their house is going to be behind there. I don't yeah. want the lights directed into the houses. You understand yeah. what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah. No, they so would the be... lights can go yes. downwards. Absolutely, they would be downward. They would be in the yes. soffit. They would be in the soffits. That's right. And um, yeah. were you thinking about like buffering the back there with a few trees or something, like you know? Would that be a problem, putting a few trees at the back there as no, a buffer? Not at, all. not at all. And I very much appreciate that, Mr. Chung. Thank you so much and best of luck in your business. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Preg. Councillor Link, any questions for Mr. Jung? Um, a couple. Um, the first thing, um, just to, when, when do you suppose a ballpark figure for the date of completion, completion of this building, if all goes well? Um, end of spring. Okay, so that's great. Um, the reason I asked that question is because of the, the secans, because we've been asking, we've been allowing a year for people to comply. Um, the second thing was the the um, you're you're the tenant, and the owner would have a DA. I I think the owner has a DA on the property. Am I, am I correct? You would. not I, I I am the I am the owner and the you tenant. You are the owner, so yes, you got correct. a development agreement. Yes. And I'm sure the development agreement contains landscaping uh, requirements. Yes, correct. We're, we're, was some buffering behind the, tr the building as Councillor Perag suggested, a part of that landscape plan? I don't believe it is, but um, if you, the, the, the landscaping was the front, which in the pictures, if you had seen the pictures, we've, yeah. um, we did, a, I think a very good job in landscaping. Um, yes. A lot. There is no. I don't know what the uh, master plan is for that. The buffer space. I have yet to see anybody um, do any form of landscaping back there. But we are certainly, you know, open to comply with any any suggestions you have. Um, we. I think that would make us the first person to landscape behind the uh, between the fence and the buffer zone. Well, I think it would be a wonderful thing to do. <laughs> yep. All right. No more it, questions. It, it's, yeah, it's just the fence is fairly high. It sits on a berm plus a fence. And then the fact the building is is that, you know, there would be, um, there's very, very little people that would see the landscaping. I agree forestry is beautiful um, versus, the you know, the brush that is there. But um I, I do not have an answer to what is the requirements there, but we're open to, you know, obviously follow the bylaws, the planning. Okay. Uh, and, and of course you're complying with your DA. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Buschetti, you had your hand up again. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just missed one of my notes here on, I, I'm getting back to that 10 feet on the back there. The, the gray area on the map is pretty well a, a berm with the fence area. I'm just having a problem with that 10 feet around the building. Like, there, there's no way you could kick that building ahead another 10 feet just to, like the homes are gonna have what, at least a 25 foot setback. It's, it's these back buildings is my biggest issue that, you know, when this area was up, I don't think it was initially even thought of by council that there would be more buildings back there, but it's, it is a manufacturing level business does increase you might start doing more stuff to it just to be on the safe side I, i'm would like to see it you know i'm not asking to pull it way ahead even a little more room to get just to make that buffer a little better that's just my biggest concern i think if it boiled down to it yes we would certainly uh you know if that was the requirement for this to to happen um we would do that i would like to make note though um, and you, you know, unfortunately, there's no aerial view of this. The a neighboring business, which is an automotive repair shop, um, extends substantially uh, further back than ours, and it's a, a much higher building. So it's a two-story building. 
um, that sits to the east of us and it's a second build. So I, you know, in, in retrospect of us moving ours forward, I would have to say, well, you know, is there, is there not some precedent set or, you know, requirement of why we would be, you know, and perhaps the uh, Red River, David, the Red River planning can address that. But I, we sort of looked and sized it out and, and figured that, you know, we were, um, we were a smaller building, we were further ahead and, um, and we're not a two-story building. So I can understand from a resident side of view, you've got a two-story building there with windows and so forth and residents, you know, with properties in the back looking, you know, their view is this, is a, is a building like that. So that was approved and that's built and it's up. So um, I, you know, I, I think we're trying to, uh, um, to do, do one step better there, but where it is, is, yeah, I mean, you know, if you tell me, Councillor, move it 10 feet up, we're going to move it 10 feet up. We, we really, we need this building. So I'm going to comply with whatever ordinance you, you give me to make this happen. But, um, you know, the 50 foot plus it's that, that gray is not a berm. That gray is flat. And then at the end of the property line, it goes up onto a very large berm. And on top of that is probably an eight foot tall fence. Uh, you know, so the total I'm going to say is getting, you know, we're eight, it's 12 to 15 feet high at the top of the fence bay, uh, versus a ground level. Um, so the whole, the whole development was built with that berm in mind to, you know, for privacy to the, to the tenants. Um, and no, I understand what you're saying. It, it just, it, you're right. If we would have had a, a newer aerial on this showing what it, it's, I'm trying to make sense of it, of a bunch of lines and different colors. So yeah I, I understand what you're saying thanks for yep. the your answer okay thank you thank you councillor link you've got your hand up go ahead mute to to the same topic i think the planner could confirm that this building has a rear yard setback that is in compliance with the zoning um, I think he's compliant. The, 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 please, the planner could perhaps confirm that. Mr. Planner. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. So it's uh, a 25 uh, feet minimum uh, rear yard requirement in this zone. Um, the proposed building is well in excess of that 25 feet uh, requirement uh, from the rear yard. So our office would have no concerns with, uh, with the placement of the building in terms of uh, zoning bylaw requirements. Thank you for the clarification. Councillor Prey, go ahead. Mr. Jung, yeah, Mr. Jung, the yes. front of your building is beautiful, beautiful landscaped because I passed through there and I look at the landscaping and I was wondering at the back, I'm not toward the high fence and the, the, the height of the building. All I'm worried if you can put up about approximately 15 trees for thing there that will, that's my only thing there for the back. Put about 15 trees to cover the whole thing and that will be fine. Um, yeah, I, again, I am, uh, I'm open to whatever suggestions yeah, you are. No, I believe, I, I, don't I, believe want to... I, I, I think we've, yes, as you, as you've stated, you know, we, we did spend a lot of extra over and above what we had to do in the front. Um, it was part of, you know, the image we wanted to, to give. Um, what I think you're asking, you know, as far as the back, um, you know, it, would it be beautiful to, spend, to put 15 trees in? I agree, but is that part of the, um, is that part of the planning bylaw that, that states that area needs to be treed? Because I don't see any other trees there. Um, and, uh, you know, would I like a nice forest in the back? I think that would be beautiful. Um, if I'm the only one having a forest in the back, does that make any sense, though? Uh, that's my my only question to you. No, I, I agree with you, Mr. Chum. Yeah. Just, um, just I was thinking about the people at the back. I fully understand where you're coming from. And I don't want to put a scare in you or anything, you know? <laughs> it's just I'm worried about the people at the back, you know, the people. But, and I also think... Man, 
I, I also, if I can just, um, the tree would have to be pretty big for the people at the back to actually see because, <laughs> um, as I said, the berm is probably six feet, the fence is eight feet. Hi. So, you know, you're 12 feet before they even could see the top of the tree, it's going to be, <laughs> you know, you plant an eight foot tree, it's going to be five years before they can see the tip of it. <laughs> I fully understand, Mr. Chung. I fully understand. Thank you. Thank you. Like we want to make West St. Paul greener. I, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I, for myself, I do want to commend you on, on the front landscaping that you've done in front of your building. It is just gorgeous. So it's always beautiful to drive down Capitalist and see what you've done in front there. So I do commend you for that. I, I share the, the concerns uh, raised by Councillor Prague. Uh, I know it's going to take a, a few years and, and I don't think you should have to go out and spend a ton of money and plant massive trees or anything. But if you plant something now, it's going to be over five years before houses are behind you anyway. So Fair it'll enough. be 10 years before you have trees come, uh, houses come in behind there. Um, and, and just so that you are aware, we have asked other businesses uh, along Capitalist that have come to us for exterior storage or a permit for a storage container. Um, this council has asked them to plant trees as well. So sure. you don't see any of your neighbors doing it yet, but they will be. They'll be, they'll be cleaning up and, and, and planting and making sure that the back looks good too. Thank you, Mayor Christine. I, I, I'm completely in favor of planting trees. So I'm just, you know, if that's, uh, I, I love you, the you green. Want to be unreasonable. The yeah, nope. we don't want to be unreasonable. So we're, we're, we're just wanting to make sure that there's going to be good compatible use in the future here. So um, I, I think it's great. I, I think it's if you can have lights that don't point back and that's something that we can add as a condition um, that, that the lights aren't um, facing the back so that we don't have complaints in the future. Um, in addition with the letter of clearance, um, you'll have to deal with storage issues and you can speak with the planner about that. Um, and if we can put in as a condition, the tree buffer um, I'm glad to hear that you're agreeable to that. And, and those are all the questions I have. And we're going to see if, uh, if there's people registered in support or opposition. And you'll get an opportunity to speak uh, if, if you want to speak in response to any comments made from, from residents. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Elias, do we have anyone registered in support, opposition, or for information? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, we have Jeff Haverbach in favor, as well as David Dick. And we have Ben McGillivray registered for information. Um, and I could add just in regards to uh, buffer trees at the back, our, our general standard would be that there would be uh, a minimum of one tree for every 15 feet. And Ms. Elias, is that out of the development agreement or, or the zoning bylaw? That's out of the development agreement. Okay. One tree for every 15 feet? Correct. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. And no one is wishing to speak on the item then, Ms. Elias? No one else, no. Okay. Mr. Jung, is there anything else that you're wanting to add? No, I think you, uh, you've brought up some, you've asked some good questions. I hope I've provided some good answers. Um, and I think the pictures, uh, you know, if we had an aerial view, that would have been helpful. But I think, uh, I think from the front, you can sort of get an idea. And uh, I'm pretty much in favor of whatever you decide. Great. Thank you, Mr. Jung. I'll just see, is there any other questions from Council? And um, Councillor Clyburn, I'm just going to ask you just to make sure because I can't see you. So just to make sure. No questions. Thank you. All right, then. Thank you, Mr. Jung. We'll close the public hearing and council will decide on this matter. Be it resolved thank, you. That thank you. Be it resolved that council do hereby close the public hearing and resume the regular meeting of council. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Pregg, seconded Councillor Bruschetti. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed? And that is carried. And I will read the resolution. And when I get to the third uh, condition after that, Mr. Patton, can I have you read the additional conditions? Certainly. Thank you. Whereas the applicant has applied for conditional use 4420 to permit the manufacturing and sales use assembly of spas and saunas at 835 Capitalist Drive, Lot 5, Plan 58339 in the Commercial Highway Zone. 
And whereas under the provisions of the Planning Act, a public hearing has been held to hear representations for and or against the conditional use application. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Royal Municipality of West St. Paul approves conditional use 4420 under the following conditions. One, that conditional use approval be limited to allow assembly of spas and saunas on the subject property as proposed within the application. Any changes in use will require a new conditional use approval. Two, applicant owner to obtain all required permits, including but not limited to those from the Red River Planning District and RM of West St. Paul. Three, all manufacturing and assembly associated with the business shall occur within an enclosed building. Mr. Patton. Number four, applicant slash owner to obtain a letter of clearance from the RM indicating that the property is in compliance with all applicable RM bylaws and development agreements. Five, that lighting on the proposed building will comply with section 3.16.7 of the zoning bylaw. And I'll just note there that there are uh, regulations in the zoning bylaw that would restrict um, uh, lighting from, from uh, being directed towards adjacent properties. Um, condition simply references that, that, that uh, section. Uh, and number six, that the approved landscaping plan be amended as required to in include trees, uh, one per 15 linear feet along the rear property line to the satisfaction of the CAO. Perfect, thank you. The approval of a conditional use will expire and cease to have any effect if it is not acted upon within 12 months of the date of the decision. A board, council, or planning commission may extend the deadline under subsection 1 for an additional period not longer than 12 months if an application is received before the additional deadline. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Bruschetti, seconded by Councillor Prague. Any discussion on the application? Recorded vote, please. Okay, Ms. Shaw, request for a recorded vote. Councillor Link, go ahead. Oh, you're still on mute. You're still on mute. My clicker wasn't clicking. <laughs> we got you now. <laughs> okay. Um, even though current approvals uh, for the business do not allow for exterior storage on the property, uh, could we put in a condition that once the, build, the second building is completed, that there be no exterior storage permitted? Can we add that? I think the planner had talked to us that he's got to come back for a, a conditional use for the exterior storage. Oh, all right. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I'm then. getting that right, Mr. Patton. We can't be adding the conditions about the storage container or the exterior storage. That's got to be a separate application. Yes, I, I would say those would be best addressed through the letter of clearance condition. Um, referencing uh, uh, that the exterior storage is, is a certain Go. date would be contradictory. We'll come back. Why law as it exists right now, which huh? doesn't allow exterior storage without conditional approval. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Link. Any other comments for discussion? Hearing and seeing none then, I will call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed? And that is carried. That has passed, Mr. Jung. Thank you for joining us and uh, congratulations on your successful business. We're excited to see growing businesses in West St. Paul. So keep up the great work. All right, we are on to the next public hearing um, and I will open the uh, public hearing. Be it resolved that this meeting of council recess for the purpose of holding a public hearing pursuant to section 74.1 of the Planning Act. Can I have a mover please? Moved by Councillor Link, seconded Councillor Pereg. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed and that is carried, thank you. Mr. Patton and Ms. Ferguson, I will hand it over to you to go through the planning report for us. Good evening, Council. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Yes, good. Yes, you're a little quiet, but yes. Okay. Sorry, I'll try and speak up a little bit. Um, Perfect. The zoning bylaw amendment before you tonight is really a housekeeping bylaw intended to address discrepancies and provide clarity to bylaw interpretation. 
uh, of particular note are some discrepancies within the multifamily zones which only impact a small area of the municipality. With that, uh, Mr. Payton will uh, speak to these in much greater detail as part of his presentation, but I just wanted to provide uh, an overview of that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you. So um, as, uh, as the executive director uh, mentioned, uh, these amendments uh, are what we consider housekeeping amendments. They are to clarify or make relatively minor adjustments uh, to the existing regulations. Uh, they do not change the intent of the bylaw as it relates to existing planning policies. Uh, and none of the proposed amendments change permitted lot sizes or allow for more dwelling units on a lot than what is currently permitted. In other words, there's no increase in density being proposed as part of these amendments. Um, there is one amendment that changes a yard requirement or proposes to change a yard requirement uh, in one zone, uh, but otherwise the permitted massing in terms of site coverage or height will not change. Um, and so um, uh, basically the amendments are to facilitate administration and interpretation and to streamline the development process specifically for multifamily and two family uh, dwellings where those are already permitted um, uh, as per the current uh, regulations. So why are these regulations coming before council now? So some of the proposed amendments relate specifically to the RMF1 uh, serviced multifamily residential one zone. This zone was created, uh, came into effect back in May 2017. Uh, however, our office is only now receiving the first building permit applications uh, to develop properties in this zone. And administering the zone regulations uh, through the permitting process uh, has brought to light some inconsistencies and uh, mistakes uh, regarding the two family and multiple family regulations that the proposed amendments would address. Uh, since these amendments are being proposed, it was also an opportunity to address some other housekeeping amendments previously identified as requiring uh, clarification or revision. And I'm speaking specifically now about the, um, uh, the proposed amendments to the permitted building projections and temporary additional dwelling regulations. So there are eight proposed amendments um, and I'm gonna to speak uh, to each one individually. Uh, so I just wanted to give a, a, an upfront um, guide to, uh, to these amendments. Uh, and these numbers before you here correspond to the, uh, the numbers of the amendments in the actual amending bylaws proposed. So uh, if anyone's following along with the amending bylaw, the numbers correspond. So the first uh, amendment has to do with parking space table. Uh, amendments two through five um, deal with permitted building projections and the section of the zoning bylaw that, uh, that outlines those regulations. Um, the sixth amendment is specific to temporary additional dwellings, the seventh uh, to residential use table, and the eighth amendment is to the residential bulk table. So again, I'm gonna speak uh, in detail about each one of these proposed amendments. Some of them do have multiple components um, so uh, again, we'll, we'll look at those uh, as we discuss the individual amendments. So the first uh, amendment uh, is uh, changes being proposed to the parking space table. So the first thing um, uh, that's happening, there's a couple different changes being proposed and I'll, I'll go through each one individually. So the first thing is removing uh, the examples of multiple family dwellings provided in the use column to the right. Just say that um, the top table uh, that says existing is the, are, are the existing uh, regulations uh, in the current bylaw. Uh, the proposed table beneath it uh, is that same section of the bylaw, but with the proposed amendments incorporated. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is that the examples uh, have been removed in the proposed, um, proposed use column. And the reason for that is twofold. First, uh, it's redundant. Multiple family dwellings are already defined in, in the definition section of the zoning bylaw. Uh, the second reason is that one of the examples given, a duplex, is actually uh, not a multiple family dwelling. By definition, it's a two family dwelling. Uh, and so this is a, a clear mistake uh, that, uh, that should be rectified in order to uh, prevent any confusion about uh, what these um, requirements apply to. The other changes that are being proposed have to do with the right hand uh, column. So there's three uh, main things uh, in this rewording that are, that are being accomplished. So the first is to stipulate that guest parking is only required where there is a common parking area. The regulation is currently written. It's unclear how um, guest parking uh, would be provided for uh, example, multiple family dwellings with individual driveways. So if you have one, uh, one dwelling unit uh, with an individual driveway, 
um, and that dwelling provides two spaces, for example, um, so it meets the minimum requirement. How do you provide 10% of that number uh, as, as guest parking spaces? Um, so clearly this uh, guest parking provision was intended to be uh, applied to uh, multi multifamily dwellings with common parking areas. So that's the first uh, clarification. The second is to remove the requirement for guest parking to be located at the building entrance. Uh, the reason for this is simply that um, it's difficult to, uh, to enforce um, in terms of how close is close enough to the uh, building entrance to, um, to determine that this is in compliance. Um, it also starts to dictate uh, the design uh, of the site in terms of where parking can be located. So it might restrict um, uh, a designer um, who would like to place parking, for example, in the rear yard. So in consultation with the RM, uh, it was deemed that this, uh, this uh, requirement for guest parking to be located at the building entrance be removed. Uh, the third um, change to that column would be to clarify that uh, required guest parking is to be taken from the required parking calculation of 1.8 spaces per dwelling unit, not in addition to. So the wording right now is, is not entirely clear whether that's supposed to be, uh, the guest parking is supposed to be in addition to uh, the 1.8 uh, spaces required per dwelling unit or taken from that. Um, in reviewing the original amending bylaw that, uh, that proposed this regulation, it was clear that that was to be taken from uh, the 1.8 spaces from dwelling, uh, per dwelling unit. And so uh, the rewording of that would just make that clear that it's, it's, uh, it's taken from and not in addition to the 1 point space, uh, 1.8 spaces that are required per, uh, per unit. So that's the first amendment uh, to uh, the parking space table. And I just wanted to show this map because um, multiple family dwellings, uh, the amendments would apply, of course, only to zones that permit multi-family dwellings. Um, there are three different zones in the RM that would permit uh, multiple family dwellings, the R3, the RMF1, and the RMF2 zone. Um, the map before you now shows every location in the RM where these zones are in effect. So the regulations, the changes to multifamily regulations would only directly impact the properties that you see highlighted on the map before you now. Um, of course, this is a, in itself is a small corner of the RM. Um, there are no multiple family dwelling zones anywhere else uh, in the RM. Again, it's just um, uh, the, the zones that you see before you on the map uh, here. Um, in the case of the RMF1 and RMF2 multifamily residential zones, these are exclusively uh, applied in uh, what we call emerging residential neighborhoods. So these are areas that are in the process of being uh, developed right now. And as I mentioned, we've just only just now um, recently received the first building permit applications for properties in the RMF1 zone. Uh, the R3 zone, um, there are three locations where it's applied to the east of Main Street. Um, two of them uh, have already been developed or the proposed development on these uh, properties has already been approved. So while the amendments would apply to those, um, again, the development has already been finalized, so it's unlikely to, uh, to, to affect uh, the plans on, on these. Again, I just wanted to show this map to uh, make absolutely clear that the amendments that are being proposed to multifamily regulations would only directly impact these properties that are already zoned to permit multifamily dwellings. Now, uh, uh, amendments number two to five uh, deal specifically with the portion of the bylaw um, that, uh, that regulates permitted projections uh, off of a building. So amendments number two and four uh, would clarify that cantilevers, air conditioners, and pool equipment are permitted to project into required yards in all residential zones. Uh, now, currently, the wording um, of the subsections uh, that deal specifically with cantilevers and the subsections that deal specifically with air conditioners and pool equipment, um, there's, a, there's a, a few sentences, and they end with the, the words within the RC zone only. Uh, now, it's not entirely clear what that caveat is supposed to apply to because there's a few different things mentioned in, in the subsection. And just for council's uh, knowledge, I just wanted to show the locations in the RM where that RC zone uh, is currently in effect. And there's only one. Um, so there's only one location in the entire RM uh, that's uh, uh, the RC zoning, as you can see on, on the map before you. Um, so right now, again, it's, it's unclear when you read those sections where they're supposed to apply to, where are these uh, projections uh, supposed to be permitted. There's that uh, caveat within the RC zone only, but it's not clear that that is supposed to restrict the projections themselves uh, or whether uh, it's supposed uh, to um, restrict 
crossing the property line, as, as you can see if you if you read the uh, um, the existing uh, regulation. So the the proposed wording would would uh, make it abundantly clear that these are permitted uh, projections in all residential zones. Uh, clarify the uh, the uncertainty uh, or the uh, open interpretation that currently exists in, in the zoning bylaw. Uh, amendment number three. Uh, would allow decks not higher than two feet, uh, two feet above grade to project into required yards. Currently, uh, the bylaw states that decks higher than two feet above grade are permitted to project into required yards, certain uh, decks higher than two feet above grade. Uh, the intent was clearly for uh, this to be decks not higher than two feet above grade. There's no rationale for why uh, a deck that's higher than two feet would be permitted to project to be closer to a property line. Um, but a deck that's two feet or lower would not. Uh, of course, the, the deck that's lower is going to have less uh, impact uh, on a neighboring property. And just as a side note, um, St. Andrews, uh, the arm of St. Andrews zoning bylaw had a similar provision that was also written, uh, my understanding, uh, by the province originally um, that omitted this word not, and they later amended it to include the word not, just to make it, um, again, it was a clear mistake um, uh, omitting that word not, and so the amendment would just rectify that by inserting the word not into this existing regulation. Um, the fifth um, amendment, um, again, has to do with projections. This would allow for exterior finish to project into any required yard, not more than four inches. Um, so there are similar allowances uh, like this in the, uh, for example, City Brandon or the town of Stonewall. Uh, within our own um, planning district, uh, the uh, arm of East St. Paul gives designated officers uh, discretion to allow certain projections, which could include uh, exterior finish. So there's certainly a precedent uh, elsewhere for allowing this type of uh, projection. Uh, what we see now without this allowance is uh, we will approve building permit applications that um, have the uh, minimum uh, side yard requirement or rear yard or front yard. They meet the minimum uh, yard requirements. Um, once the house is actually constructed, the, uh, the footing um, uh, or the foundation meets the, uh, the setbacks proposed on building plans. Uh, but when the finish is added, whether it be decorative brick or stucco or vinyl siding or, uh, uh, or anything similar, uh, often that, um, that exterior finish projects uh, an inch or two into the required yard. There's currently no allowance for that. So what that means is that the, the property owner or the homeowner, uh, in order to ensure that the building is in compliance with, uh, with the regulations of the zoning bylaw, needs to obtain a, an in-house variance from our office. Um, this adds unnecessary costs uh, to the tune of $399 for an in-house variance. Um, of course, it adds time to, to any development, um, as well as takes resources from our office, uh, the Red River Planning District, to, uh, who need to process uh, these variances. So those are the, um, the amendments that are being proposed to the uh, permitted projections section of the, of the zoning bylaw. The uh, next uh, amendment, number six, uh, has specifically to do with temporary additional dwellings. Now, uh, temporary additional dwellings by definition are detached portable dwelling units placed on the same property as a single family dwelling uh, to be occupied by a uh, family uh, who require or provide care from or occupants of the single family dwelling. There are conditional use in agriculture and rural residential zones, which means before any of these could be placed on a property, a uh, council would need to approve them. Um, this amendment would not change the definition and it would not change where they can be considered. Uh, it would simply allow a wider type of, uh, of foundation types uh, to be permitted. So again, by definition, temporary additional dwellings must be designed to be portable. And to that end, uh, the regulations currently state that only patent post foundations are permitted. Uh, again, intended to ensure that these buildings can be portable. Um, but since that was written, other types of portable foundations have uh, come to prominence. For example, screw in anchor uh, foundations. Uh, and so this amendment would expand um, the range uh, of temporary foundation types from simply allowing po patent posts to allowing any type of, uh, of temporary foundation. I brought this map up again, uh, showing where multiple family residential zones are, are applied in the RM because the next two amendments, uh, amendments number seven to the residential use table and number eight to the residential bulk table 
uh, specifically have to do with multiple family dwellings and two family dwellings. So I just wanted to show this again uh, to again state that these amendments would apply to these areas uh, only, the areas that are zoned to allow for multiple family dwellings. The amendments would not change um, properties with other zones. Okay, so uh, again, there are three residential uh, multifamily zones that are in effect, uh, R3, RMF1, and RMF2, and this map shows every location in the RM where these zonings are currently applied. There's a few um, different components to the amendments to the residential use table, and of course, I'll go through them individually. So the first um, change, and again, the existing um, part of the table is on top. The table on the bottom shows that same portion of the table with the proposed amendments incorporated. So the first amendment uh, would be to add two family dwelling as a distinct use category in the residential use table. Um, it's not there currently uh, in what's a clear oversight. It, it's defined separately in the definition section of the bylaw. Um, two family dwelling is defined separately from multifamily dwelling. Two family dwelling is two units, uh, multifamily dwelling is three or more units. Uh, and so when these were added, uh, when the zones were added uh, that would allow these types of uses, uh, two family dwelling should have been added uh, as well as a distinct use category. It was not. Um, that despite some of the zone descriptions in the zoning bylaw clearly stating that two family dwellings or types of two family dwellings are appropriate uh, uses in, in those multifamily zones. Um, so this amendment would add two family dwelling to the table uh, only in zones where multifamily dwellings are already permitted. So again, no increase in density, no increase in the amount of units that's permitted on a lot. Uh, and it would, all, uh, in doing so, would, uh, would ensure that um, that the use table is consistent with those zone descriptions I mentioned earlier uh, that again explicitly talk about types of two-family dwellings being permitted. So again a clear um, omission uh, which uh, which this amendment would correct. Uh, related to that is uh, um, amending where secondary suites can be considered as conditional uses. So again secondary suites um, by definition are um, distinct uh, units uh, that are a uh, so they're self-contained dwelling units attached to permanent single-family dwellings. Um, in other words, they're two-family dwellings. They create two-family dwellings. Um, so it's redundant um, to uh, have them considered as a conditional use um, where two-family dwellings are already permitted. And I should say there, there is a difference between secondary suites and two-family dwellings, uh, that being that there are restrictions on secondary suites in terms of size, uh, etc., uh, and of course, uh, unlike two family dwellings, they are conditional uses only, uh, which means that before any secondary suite is approved, it would require approval uh, from council. So this amendment would change, um, would only allow secondary suites to be considered in zones that don't permit two family dwellings. Uh, the third change to this uh, table would be to remove references to notes that do not exist. So if you look at the, um, multifamily dwelling row of the table on, on the top, you can see there's a couple of references in there, C note below and C three, four below. When these amendments, when these wordings were, um, were being proposed to the bylaw, somewhere along the amending process, um, the notes that these reference were removed from the, from the bylaw, they didn't make it into the final bylaw, but the references to them uh, remained. So uh, as you can imagine, that creates some confusion if you're trying to uh, administer the bylaw uh, or just understand the regulations that are applying and you're looking to find these notes that, that don't exist. Um, so that's the third item for the uh, residential use table amendments would be to remove those references to notes uh, that, uh, that do not exist in the bylaw. The final um, set of amendments um, grouped under amendment number eight to the residential bulk table. So there's four different um, uh, components to this amendment, and again, I'll speak to them individually. So the first is to allow a zero-foot side yard along party walls shared by two or more dwelling units. Now, this is already explicitly permitted in the RMF1 zone. However, the other two multifamily residential zones, the R3 and the RMF2, um, which you can see on the map before you uh, here. So again, this amendment um, that I'm speaking, speaking to now would only apply to these two zones. Um, 
these do not uh, explicitly allow a zero foot side yard setback where uh, where there's a shared party wall between uh, buildings. So um, this uh, amendment would extend that provision that again is already in place for the RMF one zone into these other uh, two uh, multifamily residential zones. And uh, I just want to give council a, a visual um, example of what I'm referring to. So uh, in this example, uh, this is a site plan, a top down view. So imagine this is a proposed three unit uh, dwelling. So it's permitted in the zone. Uh, as you can see by the notation, all our yard requirements are being met. Our office can issue a permit. There are no issues here. Um, however, if the um, uh, whoever's constructing this or, or selling the lots wants to, uh, or even the people buying the lots want to have individual units uh, under ownership. Um, so, um, uh, to allow for each unit to be owned individually, um, there would be property lines added along these shared uh, common walls. This all of a sudden creates an issue in these two zones that don't explicitly allow for that zero foot interior side yard uh, setback where those common walls. So all of a sudden we go from a, a building that's permitted and there's no issues by adding um, these uh, property lines along the, uh, along the common walls. In other words, in, in, in doing something that would facilitate home ownership um, and would allow for the individual units to be uh, held uh, individually uh, under different ownerships, all of a sudden we create a situation where um, a number of variances are required for in this case uh, before our office could issue uh, um, that's because again, uh, there's an interior side yard requirement in all in all uh, multifamily residential zones, and only the RMF one explicitly allows a zero foot setback for shared common walls. So the, this amendment would just extend that provision to the other two um, multifamily residential zones. Again, it wouldn't um, it wouldn't change uh, where multifamily dwellings are permitted. Uh, it would this amendment again, if I pull up that map, is specific to these two uh, zones. Um, the map before you now shows the RMF1 uh, zone and where it is it, where it is currently applied um, in the RM. And the reason I'm showing it is because the next two components of this eighth and final amendment have to do specifically with the RMF1 zone. So I thought it would be helpful for council to know exactly where that zone is in effect in the RM. And as you can see, this is a, a map of the entire RM. There are uh, six um, areas that are zoned RMF1. They're all located in the Middle Church Settlement Center area um, in emerging residential neighborhoods. And again, these are neighborhoods that are currently in the process uh, of being developed uh, with residential units. Um, and as I mentioned previously, we're, we're only now seeing the first uh, building permit applications for, uh, for properties in this zone. So I just wanted to bring this up because I think there was some, um, I, I want to avoid any uh, confusion about where these amendments would affect. So the only uh, places that these amendments to the RMF1 zone regulations would affect are those six areas uh, that are shown on the map. Um, those are the only areas in the entire RM that are currently zoned RMF1. Um, so if we zoom in a little closer, you can see again, um, those areas are, are only in the emerging residential neighborhoods um, and, uh, and they're, uh, they're, these are neighborhoods that, uh, that again are, are just in the process of being developed. So I want to make that abundantly clear that these, uh, these uh, next proposed uh, changes that I'm going to be speaking to will only apply again to the RMF1 zone. So oh, uh, the first uh, one I'll speak to, again, it's the second uh, component of this uh, amendment to the residential bulk table, would be to amend the side yard requirements in the RMF1 zone. So currently as written, there's an interior side yard requirement of eight feet, a corner side yard requirement of five feet. Now this is highly unusual in itself. Uh, typically a corner side yard requirement would be greater than an interior side yard requirement in order to ensure adequate visual sight lines, for example, uh, for corner properties. In fact, RMF1 zone is the only zone in the entire uh, RM um, that has a, uh, an interior side yard larger than a corner side yard requirement. So it's an anomaly. Um, and uh, um, we did consult with the, um, the consultant who originally drafted these regulations and confirmed that 
the intent was never to have an eight foot interior side yard requirement. Uh, the intent was to have a four foot side yard requirement. So just to give a the step back and give a, a little background into these regulations. So they were originally proposed um, um, or drafted by a planning consultant uh, and brought into effect. Um, and, uh, and so as part of the uh, due diligence for this application, our office reached out to that consultant to discuss um, these amendments and they indicated that the original intent uh, was never again to have an eight foot interior side yard um, that somewhere along the way, um, the regulation, uh, a mistake was made um, and the interior side yard requirement, which should have been eight feet, or should have been four feet rather, uh, was, uh, was written as eight feet. And so um, the proposed amendments here would reduce that interior side yard requirement down from eight feet to four feet. Again, these only apply in that RMF1 zone um, that I showed the map uh, of earlier. Uh, and it would increase the corner side yards uh, from five feet to uh, eight feet. Uh, now, there are a couple aspects of the RMF1 zone that I want to point out, um, which could explain um, why it's reasonable to consider uh, um, an interior side yard of, of four feet in a multifamily residential zone. Um, first of all, uh, the RMF1 zone can only be applied to properties designated emerging residential neighborhoods. So again, it's a limited geographical air, uh, area where this zone can be applied. The second is the maximum height in the zone is 35 feet. Now that's the same maximum height as applied to uh, the residential zones that only permit single family dwellings. So in, in, the, in terms of bulk regulations, in terms of height, uh, this zone uh, has more in common with the single family dwelling zones than say the other two RMF2 uh, and uh, R3 multifamily uh, zones. And the third point I want to make is that the RMF1, although it permits two family and multiple family dwellings, it only permits these types of uh, developments if the individual units have direct access to ground level. So again, similar to a single family dwelling, um, it would not permit a type of, uh, for example, an apartment building with a common entrance with uh, units accessed off a, of a, a common hallway. That type of development is not permitted in the RMF1. Again, what, the only thing that's permitted in terms of multifamily and two-family dwellings um, are developments that have individual unit access from ground level. So given these uh, restrictions that are already in place in the RMF1 zone, together with the indication from the consultant who drafted the, uh, uh, these regulations that uh, the intent was always to have a four-foot interior side yard, um, uh, it's reasonable for council to consider um, an, an interior side yard of four feet in this zone uh, and it would be compatible with adjacent single family areas many of which are zoned rs which i will note also has a uh, interior side yard requirement of just four feet um, just another um, note that i had is is the minimum lot width in rmf1 uh, zone is 24 feet so if you have a 24 foot lot and eight um, uh, is required for an interior side yard that leaves just 16 feet uh, for a, a unit width. In addition to, to that width, um, some properties, not all, but some of the properties that are zoned RMF1 uh, have a development agreement registered on the title that would limit uh, any proposed structure to one story. Um, so that means for these lots that have that development agreement in place, um, that uh, they'd be limited um, um, to uh, 16 feet, as little as 16 feet, depending on the lot width. Um, and only one story. Um, so moving on to uh, the final two amendments that, uh, that make up this eighth and final amendment. So uh, C would be to add an interior side yard requirement of three feet for detached accessory buildings in the RMF1 zone. Um, right now, and again, what's a clear omission or mistake, there isn't a, a, um, a, an interior side yard requirement listed So this uh, component of the amendment would simply add uh, a requirement which is being proposed as three feet. That's sort of the minimum um, uh, that the RM and, and our office would recommend um, in order to allow for a typical eave to overhang and still be the minimum of, of one foot uh, from a property line. Um, just as a, a point of reference, the city of Selkirk requires uh, two feet in a lot of their residential zones for detached accessory buildings. In West St. Paul, some zones 
uh, had minimum rear yards of, of three feet. And so we believe it's reasonable um, to, uh, to propose a, th a three foot uh, interior side right requirement. Again, this would only apply to detached accessory buildings in the RMF1 zone. And then the final component of this final uh, eighth amendment is to clarify language in the notes section of the residential bulk table. Now I'm not going to speak to this in detail because none of the um, uh, none of the uh, changes that are being proposed would would change anything uh, in terms of the intent of, of the bylaw uh, or of the notes. Uh, this is simply uh, clarifying the language so that we can interpret more easily uh, as written. There's some uh, it's supposed some interpretation challenges. So um, again, I would refer to the amending bylaw itself uh, for the exact wording changes. But the intent is simply to clarify the language in those in those notes that are, again already exist. So um, as part of uh, this application uh, processing the application, we referred it to commenting agencies, for example, provincial departments, um, adjacent municipalities, uh, utilities, um, and uh, none of the commenting agencies that were referred to the application had any uh, concerns. And I just want to note, since the report was written, we, we uh, received two additional notes of no concern. Uh, those were from the uh, Water Management Planning and Standards Branch of Manitoba Infrastructure uh, and the Community Planning Branch of Municipal Relations. So again, no concerns from either of those agencies or any of the, um, uh, any of the commenting agencies that were referred these uh, amendments to review. Similarly, our office has no concerns with the amendments. Um, they're generally consistent with the development plan and secondary plan policies that are in place. And so we recommend the amendments could be approved. Now, uh, it's my understanding that uh, there are sufficient objections um, to this um, proposed, uh, to the proposed amendments. So the council will not be able to give third reading um, uh, tonight to the bylaw. Now they, they can, uh, you can give second reading to, to the zoning bylaw. But I just wanted to give a brief overview of the uh, the process um, after that. So, if council chooses to give second reading, um, then uh, our office will then contact all the objectors um, to uh, to see if they would like to confirm their objection. Um, so, everyone who is uh, who is registered in opposition um, will be contacted uh, and asked to confirm their objections. If at least twenty five eligible objectors uh, confirm their objections then an appeal hearing is scheduled with the Red River Planning District Board. Um, the board will hear the matter and after the hearing, um, the board must either confirm the objections, which means that third reading cannot proceed or that it can only proceed with any changes specified by the board. Or the board can confirm the bylaw uh, in which third reading uh, can proceed. So that's just a general overview of the process uh, moving forward should council choose to give second reading to the uh, proposed amendments uh, this evening. That's all I have for the application, Madam Mayor. Uh, of course, we welcome any questions. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patton. I'm going to go around the virtual council table and I'll start this time with Councillor Bruschetti. Any questions for the planners? Thanks, Mr. Patton, for that long-winded uh, big explanations on everything, a lot of changes there. Um, I'm going to just ask, I guess, for some clarity. I am not sure if you were aware there was a letters circulated around the municipality. I'm all for the residents getting information. I would just like to clarify a little bit of the information that's on there just to clear, clearly point out a few things that were just put in, you know, they could be taken the wrong way. Just on one of the first lines, it says um, to reduce the side interior side yards of residential properties. It's not in case, in that case, it's a two family and multi-family side yards. This is not, this can't happen all over the municipality. This is just in those designated zones, am I correct? That is correct. So the map before you shows the RMF1 uh, zones where they're applied in the, R, in the RM. The, uh, chain, the reduction in the interior side yard that I referred to and that I believe the letter is referring to only applies to these uh, areas that are zoned RMF1 zone would not change the side yard requirements in any other zone in any other part of the RM. So just to be absolutely clear, the uh, redu proposed reduction in side yard requirement um, is specific to the RMF1 zone. And again, this map shows where 
uh, the RMF one zone is applied in the municipality. And of course, it's sparingly uh, applied throughout the middle church uh, uh, area. So in, in no way it's increasing the density because these zones are already created, the lots are already created, everything like that? That's correct. The density is not being impacted by these proposed amendments in any way. If we're talking about density as, as a dwelling units per uh, amount of land, uh, the amendments would not introduce uh, new um, zones or new permitted uses in zones that would uh, increase the density. They're not changing the lot sizes. Um, so that side, there's no in increase in density being proposed as part of these um, amendments. Okay, so you're, you're, I'm just kind of surprised that it wasn't picked up at the planning level. You know, I wasn't a counselor when this came up, but I was at the meeting when they were talking the four foot, eight foot. So I can see where the mistake happened just four and four is eight. So, but I'm just surprised that it wasn't picked up on a 48 foot lot with a two family home on it. That's going to leave a 24 foot home or a 24 foot lot. Well, who's going to build a 16 foot wide home on that? I'm just surprised by the, that the numbers were not picked up when it was, you know, being reviewed prior to it being finalized. So I, I just wanted to make that comment just because we've, we've seen some stuff happening and this is the kind of stuff that creates a lot of, you know, I guess, hardship through the municipality. It, it, people are hearing things and we have to answer to this again when the bylaw has already been reviewed and it's gone through so many checkpoints and I'm still surprised to see stuff like this being being missed, which is a ma major part of the, that RMF1 zone. So thanks for the clarity on your expert. You pretty well explained a lot of the stuff. That's why I'm not going out into a lot of it with detail, but so this was more picked up just because an application was now put in for the buildings? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, this zone came into effect in, in May 2017, but our office did not receive any applications for properties in the zone until uh, very recently, uh, within the last month or so. Uh, and so the, the regulations were never road tested, so to speak, um, in, until again, the application started coming in to develop these properties. Um, and that's when these uh, inconsistencies were, were noted, and that's why the amending bylaw is coming before you tonight. Well, I appreciate you going through all that because me reading it, not being a planner, of course. So, you know, it was a little bit of, I'm going to say gibberish to me because it's not part of what I do all day, but it clarified a lot of it. And I hope it clarified it for other members of council too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Buschetti. Councillor Kleiber, any questions for the planner? And Mr. Patton, was the bylaw initiated by Red River Planning for housekeeping amendments? Um, so the bylaw uh, applicant is the RM in this case. Uh, the RRPD drafted the uh, amending bylaw. Okay, so our administration then has had input into the bylaw itself. That's correct. Um, in the, in the uh, uh, circulation of the application, was our fire department circulated in the application? I don't see that. And would that be something that you would do or we would have to do on our end? The RM fire department is not on our uh, typical circulation list. Um, I suppose, uh, of course, we would refer to the RM in general and then within uh, that, if the RM... Uh, we, we would rely on the RM to circulate it to any, any uh, departments um, that they would feel relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, also, you said that doesn't increase density, but it does increase the footprint, reducing the side yard to four feet, does it not? So there's a increase the buildable area in terms of there is already a site coverage maximum in that zone, and that wouldn't change. Um, it would increase the, uh, the possible width of a, of a building that's being proposed in that zone. Um, so Which increases the footprint, right? It, it could, but again, there's a maximum site coverage. Regardless of the, of the yard requirements, there's a maximum site coverage that's in place uh, in every zone. Um, that okay. Footprint, yeah. 
I think one of the comments made by one of, um, there was a comment made that um, uh, if we didn't increase the side yard, we would have long skinny houses. Would you concur with that comment? Well, all I can say in regards to that is again, the width uh, for properties in the RMF one zone is 24 feet. So if you have an eight foot interior side yard, um, that means that you can have a maximum um, a unit of 16 feet on, on that property. Um, All right. So the other option is for if, if they wanted to have more space on the side or make it wider is just to make a bigger lot. Is that correct? That would be an option, correct. Right. Okay. And um, I also noticed um, there was a switch on 8C. And it was a switch from a side yard to three feet. I'm just trying to, just trying to navigate through it. I gotta be honest with you. That was a very long document with a lot of changes. And of course my computer just died. Oh boy, okay. But it was 8C. Can you just explain that to me a little bit more? Certainly. So I believe you're 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 referring to the uh, the adding of a, an interior side yard requirement for detached accessory buildings in the RMF one zone. So in that zone, if you look at the current zoning bylaw, the table uh, just doesn't have a number in there. Um, so uh, there is a setback requirement um, for for detached accessory buildings that share a common boundary in that zone. Uh, but okay. Your typical detached accessory buildings right now in the RMF one zone, there is no interior side yard requirement was not okay. it's not part of the bylaw so we're we're imposing one so question for you if we're imposing uh, uh, a new side yard why wouldn't we mirror the one that you're suggesting which is the four feet instead of the three feet council can certainly uh if that's the will of council that yard requirement um, of three feet can certainly be uh increased to, to four feet um okay. The uh, three feet was proposed uh, in order to give um, um, sort of- Just a, provide something, right? <laughs> well, it, it gives council the, the ability to uh, to increase it if, if uh, they so wish. Um, okay. Yeah. And so one of your comments that you made was that you said that it's unusual for the corner side yard to be smaller than the interior side yard, correct? Right. So if the corner side yard is eight feet, then anything under eight feet would be, or would be permissible or would be in keeping with what you had said, right? So how did the four feet suggestion come about? Was it just something that you, that someone decided on or? So if you're referring to that RMF one zone uh, interior yeah. yard requirement that's currently written as eight feet, but is being proposed to change to four feet. Right. So it was uh, determined in consultation with the, again, the, um, the consultant who originally drafted that uh, part of the zoning bylaw. Um, and in conversations with them, uh, it was clear the original intent of that was for that um, interior side yard requirement to be four feet. The eight feet that currently exists in the bylaw um, that number came from um, an earlier uh, draft of the bylaw, uh, the amending bylaw, that um, referred to minimum building separation between structures. So if you can uh, picture two uh, adjacent properties, each with the four-foot side yard, uh, which is, again, what was intended, then there would be eight feet between the two buildings. And so... so okay, go ahead. So in conversation with, the again, the consultant who originally drafted the bylaw, the intent of that eight feet was to be the building separation between the two buildings uh, on adjacent properties. It was not intended to be a, a setback from the property line to the, to the building. But unfortunately, that's how uh, that's how the amendment was uh, was drafted and, uh, and ultimately passed. So the new proposal then is it from building to building on the side yard? No, that would be from building to property line. All these side yard requirements, any yard requirement is measured from the property line to a building wall. Okay, so we're reducing it by half then. Correct. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Prague, any questions for the planner? Yes. 
Mr. Planner, can you bring the map up again, please? Um, certainly. Uh, which map would you like? The uh, RMF one zone map is uh, is up currently. Yeah, that's the one I want. So I just want to confirm the changes with you. These changes that are being made now is just limited to these property here, to the RMF one. Am I correct? Um, that wouldn't be correct for the entire amending bylaw. Now there's eight different amendments. Um, yeah. Specifically when I'm talking about the side yard being reduced yeah. from eight to 40, that specifically, uh, that amendment would only apply to the RMF one zone properties that you see before you on the map. So yes, correct. Yeah, but all this is already approved, am I correct? Yes, these properties are already zoned RMF one. So, People living in all the areas besides this will not be affected whatsoever. No, um, these, again, by, again, we're talking specifically about the side yard reduction. Yes, that. yes. Yes, so again, that would only apply and only directly affect these properties on the map before you. Now, it's conceivable that in the future, other properties are rezoned to this zone, but that process is the same one that's that's um, that we're going through with this amending bylaw right now. It would require council approval, uh, and so uh, yes, the only properties that would be that are currently zoned RMF one uh, that would be directly affected by that reduction are, are the only properties are, are shown on this map for you. Okay, uh, was it a mistake made on the original intent of the law? Yes, in, in consultation with uh, with the uh, the consultant who drafted that that uh, um, initially, it was a mistake that that ended up as is eight feet. The original intent was always for it to be four feet. And when did you learn about this mistake? That would be when we uh, within the last month or so. Um, I guess it's a little bit more than a month now when when our office received the first building permit applications for properties in this zone. Um, and they proposed a four foot side yard. And so um, um, that's what, uh, what prompted the, uh, the amendments uh, because it was realized again in consultation with the, uh, the uh, consultant who originally drafted the regulations that what ended up in the bylaw did not reflect the original intent. Would you mind naming the consultant? Certainly, and I, I believe they're registered to speak here tonight. It's uh, Lombard North Group. Thank you very much, Mr. Planner. Thank you, Councillor Prague. Councillor Link, any questions for the planner? Yes. Now, um, regarding the corner side yard, the distance from the building then to the adjacent road because there's going to be, if it's a corner side yard, there's going to be a road, it's a corner lot, it's going to have a road on one side and a road on a, another side, right? Right. Uh, you're proposing that the distance from the, from the house basically to the road, because we've got no sidewalks either. So it would be the distance from the road to the house would be five feet, that's what you want. That's what's wanted, uh, RMF1. So the current requirement in the RMF1 zone is five feet uh, corner side yard. Uh, we're proposing to increase that to eight feet. Okay. Now that distance is not to the traveled roadway itself. It's to the property line. So typically a roadway, um, the, the right of way, if you will, of the road is larger than the actual paved surface. Um, so that, that width depends, of course, on the individual road. Um, but that eight feet that we're proposing would be from the building to the property line adjacent the road. There would be additional distance between the property line and the actual paved uh, roadway. Uh, and what, what's that distance usually from then from the property line to the road? That might be a question uh, best suited for your administration. Uh, there'd be road standards um, that uh, that are followed that would specify the the minimum, you know, size of uh, of lanes and and uh, traveled surface. Okay, uh, I've got another question, and it's re in regards to the parking table. Um, 
the parking table doesn't appear to um, with the common parking area you want uh, the amended part to show the number of spaces required for a common parking area um, handicap parking is not at all accounted for i don't think in this bylaw and i think in this day and age with accessibility being a big issue that handicap parking should be addressed in this bylaw and i think what's missing also in this bylaw is the spaces that we should be allowing for handicap parking but not only that the spaces that we should be allowing for parking even in areas where there is no common parking area the reason i'm saying this is i've seen a development where the, the space from the garage door to the street didn't allow much, it, it didn't allow anything other than if the vehicle of the house happened to be a large truck, a pickup truck, that's all you could get into that driveway. And then you were having to probably step out into the road if you wanted to go around that vehicle. So our driveway, um, I think what we need to do is specify some parking space sizes um, I don't know for compact cars for trucks for for medium sized cars whatever but um, so that it affects the length of the driveway that we're requiring so uh, it really um, uh, affects the appearance of uh, the um, units. So it makes them look very, very, very tiny and compacted and uncomfortable. Well, I think the parking space, I think the spark parking table needs a lot more work than we see here. Um, and that also um, is connected with, I think it's number six, 7C, I think it is, table 14, uh, the notes. There is a revised text. It is followed by amended notes, 18 foot driveways. That allowance for a driveway, I don't think is adequate. If you're taking it from the front of the garage to the street or to the property line, it's not adequate. And we've got examples of it. We all visited a place, all of council visited a place where it was cramped up. And I think that probably the, the driveways are only 18 feet. It's just not adequate. I think that there's a lot of things in this, in this um, package that you've presented to us. It's, it's more complicated, I think, than uh, is, is first. Um, first thought. I also want to uh, respond to the comment about there's only small areas in I, the RM. Could I just finish, please? I was just going to let the planner respond to some of your questions about parking. But if, if he's taking notes, I'll just you can carry on and he can he can take notes and comment on each of your questions. Go ahead, Councillor Link. Well, I, I wanted to just make a comment. He won't have to respond to this. We're told that these areas are, are just areas and they're not going to affect, they're separate areas, they're not going to affect other areas of West St. Paul. I really am having trouble with that. Um, these areas that you see on the maps and then there's the RS areas and the RMF2s, they're embedded into existing or areas and more developments are proposed that will be embedded in and around existing areas. So the existing areas actually are impacted in my, in my books. Um,
that's all for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Link. Um, hopefully you're taking notes, Mr. Patton, just regarding the questions on parking, um, other embedded areas of RMF1, if these are things that you could address. For sure. So in regards to the, uh, um, the uh, accessible parking requirements, so, so there is a section of the zoning bylaw that does require accessible parking requirements. Um, that's table six uh, on page 35, um, section 32121. Uh, so the number of accessible spaces that's required uh, is correlated to the number of parking spaces that's required in, in general. So I, I would suggest that there already all are, are uh, provisions in, in the zoning bylaw that address accessible uh, parking. Uh, in terms of the 18 foot uh, driveway length in the RMF1 zone, again, that's a, a note that's, that's already existing, that regulation already exists, it's already approved by, by the council. Um, that, uh, it's a fair point. Uh, certainly an amendment could be brought forward to change that if council so desired, but that would fall outside of the scope of the current amendments that are being considered. So thank you for the, for the note. Um, uh, and it's something that I can, as you know, uh, our office is, is undertaking a zoning bylaw review. And so that's something that can definitely be, um, uh, be considered uh, for amendment as part of that general review, but it would fall outside the scope of these amendments. Um, I think, oh, and just to your third point about the RMF1 zone um, impacting other areas. Um, yeah, so the, the changes that are being proposed to the RMF1 zone regulations would only directly impact um, the RMF1 zone properties. Um, and I just want to make the, uh, the, the point that these are in emerging, uh, RMF1 zone is a zone that can only be applied to emerging residential neighborhoods. Uh, these are areas that, of course, they're not devoid of context. Um, but these are areas that uh, do not currently um, uh, have a substantial residential development. So they're being developed as, as neighborhoods. Um, it's of course a fair comment to say that uh, um, zoning regulations in one zone are, are going to, uh, to impact adjacent zones um, to some degree. Uh, but my point specifically is the, the regulations uh, that are proposed to being changed in terms of the side yard requirement that is specific to the RMF1 zone. Councillor Link, go ahead. Thank you. Even though um, the shrinkage of the side yards in RMF1 was a mistake, I'm of the opinion it was a fortunate mistake because I'm thinking of what the people told us in our, when we were asking for feedback about our strategic plan to maintain space. All right, this is a little bit of space, but even a little bit of extra space between buildings in my book means quite a lot to the appearance, say in 20, 30 years. It also affects people's health and well being. We know from COVID that people who have a little bit extra space. To, to have access to cope better with the situation. So I think all in all, this was probably a fortunate mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Link. Councillor Buschetti, go ahead. I just want to, just a little comment to Councillor Link on that one. Just something else we also heard in our strategic plan was that we had residents in west st paul that wanted to downsize to smaller lots with less area to to do less work in the yard that they've moved so really it's 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 what you said is exactly right but we also heard the other side of it also that people wanting to downsize from these bigger areas the riverdale area that kind of i'm just using that as an example and wanted lots that there is less maintenance on. So like we're listening, but I guess it's the balancing act here, right? That's what we're looking at. Thank you, councillors. I have a, a couple of questions if there are no other questions for the planner. Are, are we asking any other questions of the planner? Otherwise, if we wanna discuss, we could discuss later. Councillor Link, do you have questions for the planner? So I'd like to thank Councillor Busetti for voicing his opinion, and we all are respecting one another's opinions, even if they vary. Thank you. Agree. 
Thank you. Um, I, I think I, my comments, um, Mr. Patton, and questions, I want to thank you for a very detailed presentation. There's a lot of changes proposed, and you really walked it through very easily for council to follow, for residents to follow, and sometimes there's misunderstandings in what is exactly being presented and, and proposed. Um, and I know that our community is very passionate and engaged, and I commend them for that. Um, sometimes information is hard to understand and digest. So I want to commend you. You did an excellent job walking through this for us. Uh, I think a couple of the questions, um, comments made about, um, about the side yard going from eight feet to four feet. You mentioned in your presentation that we have outstanding development agreements that limit to bungalow. Um, and I think that's probably what brought this forward. So this council uh, required as part of one of these areas, and maybe you could highlight it on the map. I believe we highlighted uh, and, and forced a developer, I don't want to use that term, but required a developer to um, put in their development uh, bungalow side by sides. Because what we heard from our residents is that they wanted to downsize to homes that were accessible, um, that they could get access to by wheelchair, um, that seniors could live in those homes. And so council required that they have, I believe it was 36 bungalow um, with, with double garage. And I don't know if you can circle that, but in behind Sonova Center. So if we don't make these changes, what council did to try and help our community and address a need and avoid our community and limit two-story multifamily because there was concerns about height and wanting to make sure that it would be accessible that if this doesn't go through from the, the four yard, they won't be able to do what council asked them to do to meet the needs of our residents. Would that be, is that correct? Well, I, I don't know. Um, so, so first of all, uh, I see somebody's uh, drawn on here um, that uh, okay. uh, isn't me. I'm not, I'm not sure who, who did okay. it, but uh, uh, I do believe I can highlight. Um, so the two general areas that you're referring to, the okay. black circles uh, are now outlining. Uh, yeah. uh, so not all the properties in the in in that area that I highlighted, but some of them uh, again are restricted to to one story. Uh, in terms of whether they would be um, developable in with the current regulations, that's a that's a question for a, a developer, I suppose. Um, again, a lot of those lots are 24 feet wide, so an eight foot interior side yard would mean that only 16 feet wide, one story, 16 foot wide uh, unit could be. Uh, developed on those on those properties. So is it possible to do a 16 foot wide bungalow? Um, that that's a question for again, a, a developer, uh, that would be uh, something new. Um, okay. I'll ask maybe one of the home builders if they're if they're going to come forward. Um, a few other questions for you. Um, I know in in a presentation and and often planners say this, uh, and it's a new lingo that council and, and myself get to know on the term of housekeeping, right? Um, and, and so thanks for not using it a lot, uh, but you introduced it. And so by housekeeping for residents that are watching, um, it's cleaning up and when the intent of the bylaw isn't coming out in practicality. So when council talked about errors being missed, often they're not noticed until somebody pulls a permit and the intent of what's supposed to be in there or um, is cleaned up, right? Is that how you would fairly describe housekeeping? For sure. So zoning bylaws are, are intended to be sort of living documents that are that are being revised and, and they're they're constantly being uh, being looked at uh, as how can we improve these um, to match the current uh, conditions and, and what the intent is and what the plans and policies are in place. So they're, they're documents that require constant revision. Um, and so housekeeping is a term that that's generally used um, just to refer to amendments that their intent is to clear, clarify existing regulations, not to introduce new um, new uh, uh, policies or anything like that. Um, it's it's very common practice for zoning bylaws to to undergo housekeeping amendments every several years as part of just general um, housekeeping. And and I see a lot of those, which is great. Um, in going through some of the things that you talked about, uh, projections. Um, dealing with air conditioners that are projecting out onto side yards and things like that. In terms of housekeeping, um, this was costing our residents quite a bit of money. So as a counselor, 
Um, I, I myself sat uh, at the council table and saw 67 variances from our residents coming forward to ask for a variance on a cantilever, on an air conditioner. So this eliminates all of that cost to residents, right? Is that correct? They'd have their projected air conditioners and they won't have to come to council in, in other areas of the RM. That's right. It would, it, we would anticipate that this would cut down on the number of variances required uh, by, by having those allowances for certain types of projections. And again, there are limitations on how far they can project. Um, but yes, it would, it would uh, the, the idea is that it would cut down on variances. And save our residents money. I don't know what the fee is for those kind of variances, but it's a couple of hundred dollars at least. Uh, full variance, the cost is $666 currently. So to come for an air conditioning variance, those 67 properties, like $600 because your air conditioner projects? Uh, yes, if it, if it projects beyond, uh, yes. Wow, okay, that's a good thing. Uh, secondary suites, um, I'm glad that you did that and made that change. Uh, I think with an aging population, people are concerned about that. And so clarifying that in, in, in the zoning was good. Um, on that rental, just to be clear on the, um, changes to the zero side yards that might seem alarming to people that don't understand that council has heard a lot of comments from people that they prefer ownership versus rental and that change proposed in there on that zero interior side and how you had those lines drawn for property lines allows for ownership is that correct yeah it would certainly facilitate ownership of individual units um, uh, certainly more so than than simply having a multi multi-unit uh, building with multiple units on one lot, um, yeah. then you're looking at a condo situation or something to, if you're looking at individual unit ownership. If each unit is on an individual, individual property, that certainly facilitates home ownership. That's good. So where these bungalows are to have that zero down the, down the middle and be able to, to declare property line like that with the zero clearance allows them to sell those to people as opposed to renting them out and, and having some of the concerns, and I'm not going to bash rentals because they're important, um, but it addresses some of the concerns that we've certainly heard from residents about facilitating that ownership. Yeah, it would, it would allow for a wider range of options in terms of rental or ownership or what have you. Perfect, thank you. Um, the other question I wanted to ask, um, you talked about the side yard and we've brought up the maps and I'm glad that we are highlighting it for residents so there's real clarity about the areas that this is impacting for the um, side yard clearance there. Um, how much of the municipality would you say, and maybe this is a question for Miss Elias, that that RMF1 area takes up? Um, I, I know there's been lots of concern from residents and lots of comments made about West St. Paul is going high density, um, our community is no longer rural. I'm wondering the impacted areas here, like, and these are already previously approved, a majority of them by the previous council, one area by this council, um, what, what percentage of the municipality would this constitute? Well, I don't know uh, that I want to speculate on the percentage, but the map before you clearly shows that it's a very small uh, area of the overall uh, portion of the RM. Thank you, Mr. Planner. Miss Elias, would you have that information at all? Yes, Madam Mayor, I have that available. Uh, for the RMF1 zone property, it's about uh, 70 acres in total. And, and how many acres is the entire municipality? I don't know if you know that. Uh, for the total municipality, it's, uh, it would be about 21,000 acres in total. So our entire municipality is 21,000 acres and the impact to this is 70 acres. Yeah, it would be roughly about 0.32% uh, percent of the total. 0.32% of all of West St. Paul. That's Correct. of 1%? Yeah, less than 1%. Less than 1%. Yeah. Okay. I think it's important to clarify because one of the concerns that we had heard is about um, how much, you know, our municipality is not rural anymore. And it's really clear this is just impacting less than 1% of the municipality of things that are already approved. I'm, thank you for that information. Um, my other question um, reflects back to concerns I've heard from residents as well about we're becoming like the city, we're becoming dense like the density of the city. And, and so I just wanted to highlight, you, you had mentioned that multifamily in West St. Paul is not city of Winnipeg or 
or, or city density for a couple of reasons in terms of height, access to ground level. This doesn't apply to apartments. Can I just have you clarify that again? Because I know that's a concern that's raised. Sure. So again, I'm spe uh, speaking specifically about the RMF1 zone. Um, in that zone, it allows for two, uh, two unit and, and multi unit uh, dwellings. Um, but those units need to be ground, uh, need to have ground access, individual ground access. Uh, and there's a maximum height of 35 feet for any buildings in that zone. Okay. Um, so the, the, the effect of, of that is that uh, um, sort of high rise buildings wouldn't be permitted. Um, buildings that don't have individual unit uh, accesses off ground level would not be permitted. Uh, it's to facilitate um, the types of multifamily, for example, townhomes uh, or other side-by-side -side, uh, type uh, type units. Okay, thank you. That, that clarifies it to me. It's like comments that we often get when there's change in the municipality and and our increased density is, is not city density. Um, the other just question I had on the three foot accessory building. Um, so that's talking about a shed being three feet from the property line. That's, that's what's right. proposed? Yes. Okay. So if we increase that or change that, it means that sheds are going to be out in the middle of people's yards. So this is this is a shed being three feet to a property line or more or less, depending on what council's wanting to do there. But it's 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 often people put sheds right on the property line. So this is getting them off the property line, but not requiring sheds be in the middle of people's backyards. Yes, and again, because of uh, an omission, there isn't currently any requirement for a setback uh, for those types of uh, structures. So currently sheds could have been right on like right up to property lines. That's right. There's no current uh, setback requirement from the okay. side yard, I should clarify. From the side. Okay, good. Thank you for the clarifications. And again, thank you for your presentation. Miss Elias, we have a, a list of, uh, of- Could I just ask Mr. Patton one more question? Sure, Councillor Kleiber, go ahead. Mr. Patton, um, with regards to the bungalow duplexes that were mentioned, those are 60 foot lots. Um, you would only be gaining four feet on each side. So I don't, I don't know what a 20 foot bungalow looks like, but uh, that's the choice that was made by the builder. And if they wanted to increase the side yard, they could still come for a variance. Is that correct? That's, uh, that's correct. If, uh, if, an individual property owner wanted to apply for a variance to uh, in any in any zone anywhere in the RM they can apply for a variance to to reduce the side yard requirement that would have to be considered and approved by council. Right. So even though we're making these changes that we're saying this is the standard, if it wasn't approved, you could still apply for the variance and you could still get the variance, right? Or we'd have to vote on it, right? Council would have to consider individual properties at a time uh, and grant variances on an individual uh, property level, but yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Ms. Elias, have we got a list to go through on, um, on those registered in support uh, against and for information? And we'll start with the list of supporters as is our process. Uh, we, we do. We have Brandon Powell registered uh, as in favor, and he is with us this evening. Welcome, Mr. Powell. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Thank you for attending. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I think. <laughs> Just trying to figure out how to do that. I'm sorry, bear with me. If anybody has some tips, I'd uh, do you want me to... be happy to uh, share screen. Well, in an event like this, I have pre-sent my, uh, my my presentation to Pam. Pam, I'm not sure if you can bring it up on on your screen. Uh, yes, Mr. Powell, we, we can bring that up for you. Thank you very much. Oops. 
So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm Brandon Powell. I'm a planner with Lombard North Group. Uh, we're a planning consulting company in Winnipeg. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, just convey that uh, I'm here presenting in support of the proposed uh, bylaw amendment 2020-15P. Um, I'd like to begin with a little bit of back, uh, background here. Um, in 2016, Lombard uh, prepared the initial draft zoning bylaw amendment uh, 2016-19P on behalf of the arm of West St. Paul as the applicant. This amendment created the framework for the R uh, for the RS, RMF1, and RMF2 zones. We believe the, the approved version of this amendment was not entirely reflective of the intended draft recommendations prepared by LNG several years ago. Uh, more specifically, for some unknown, unknown reason, a nuance adjustment was made to Lombard's recommendations concerning side yards in the RMF1 zone. We understand that this adjustment has led to some issues concerning future development in West St. Paul. Uh, we're here today to present our opinion on the intent of the RMF1 side yard reg regulations. Um, I'd like to take a minute here just to dive into a comparison uh, between the adopted bylaw and LNG's previous drafts for the RMF1 uh, side yards. Um, at first glance, uh, the regulations that you see here look similar, um, but there's subtle differences that have big implications. Um, the first uh, table that you guys see is uh, what's the, what the existing zoning bylaw regulations are for side yards. So as you can see, interior side yards are about eight feet. Uh, corner side yards are regulated at five feet. Um, with respect to the interior side yards, this is the equivalent of about 16 feet between dwelling units. Um, in our many drafts of, this by, of these bylaw regulations, um, we had slightly different wording. Um, again, you see eight feet highlighted in yellow there, but that was intended to be internal side yards between dwelling groups. So dwelling groups being dwellings uh, requiring eight feet separation between them. Can go to the next slide. So this is a slide um, to illustrate uh, Lombard's original draft bylaw regulations. Uh, the first image is how uh, the side yards would be applied with groups of homes on a single lot. This is more reflective of um, a condo or rental unit projects. So as you can see, there's a gap in the middle of eight feet uh, between groups of homes, dwelling groups. Uh, the second image on the bottom uh, demonstrates the application of the side yards between lots. So as you, as you can see, again, we maintain the eight foot gap between the dwelling units. Um, with four foot separation in the side yards. Uh, the benefit of this draft wording is that it allowed flexibility for different types of development circumstances, whether you're developing multiple units on a single lot or developing units on multiple lots. Next slide. Uh, there's a few key issues with the current RMF land side yard regulations. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the first one here, but I'd like to make a planning observation that uh, the interior side yards, as mentioned by uh, uh, David Payton, um, are greater than the corner side yards. And this is not a common practice, as, as David had mentioned, um, in planning. Um, the larger corner side yards are, are desired to provide more separation between dwelling and road along the flank or the side of a lot. Slide. A bigger concern is that min the minimum requirements in the existing bylaw are not practical for development. The minimum si lot size is 24 feet. The minimum interior side yard is eight feet, which means that you get a, a dwelling unit size of 16 feet. Um, I've had the opportunity to reach out to uh, several builders um, that have, uh, have interest in West St. Paul uh, to get a better understanding of what the implications are of these types of dimensions and regulations. And unanimously, they've all come back and they've said that these regulations are too restrictive to enable them to design a practical house plan for this market. Uh, for, just to give you some context here, a 16 foot dwelling unit is equivalent to the length of a Toyota Camry. That's a sedan. 
Um, and these requirements will not allow a two car garage, which is typically around 20 feet um, on the property. And in a, in a rural community where there's no public transit, um, you're, you're vehicle dependent. So we have a situation here where homes uh, under the conditions of the minimum requirements cannot be practically built. Uh, we believe minimum zoning requirements ought to allow functional building designs. If not, they're too rigid for application. Next slide. The last issue I'd like to address is the implication of contradictory planning principles resulting from current regulations. RMF1 zones are intended to be more compact residential areas that are typically that typically provide for more affordable housing options for future residents. Under the current zoning, developers must create larger lots to accommodate functional house designs that meet market needs. Larger lots, however, will result in fewer lots to offset development costs, which will result in higher lot prices passed on to the buyer. Larger side yards offer no greater functional usage, uh, meaning the buyer will end up paying for access lot area, which offers little tangible value to an owner. As such, creating a zone to accommodate more affordable housing options, uh, but applying restrictive regulations that ultimately increase costs is contradictory in principle and creates an unintended economic barrier for home buyers and residents. Slide. Um, it's our opinion that the benefits of the proposed amendment aligned with more common pl uh, planning practice uh, practices regarding side yards. So corner side yards are greater than interior side yards. Uh, it enables practical home designs that meet market needs, mitigates the economic burden of more costly lots for home buyers, ensures the intent of the regulations uh, meet the objectives of the zone, uh, and will sustain investment in RMF1 zone lands by correcting a minor oversight with tangible implications on development. Um, in term, oh, I think we're missing one. There's a missing slide. Well, we may, you guys might be missing one slide here, unfortunately, but uh, I'll speak to it. It's, it's my last slide. Um, in terms of the application of the amendments, I'd just like to close by emphasizing that the arm of one zone is a, is a tool that can be applied strategically and most appropriately at council's discretion. Uh, there's specific areas as, as we've understood throughout the presentations today uh, where the RMF zone is applied uh, in order to minimize land use conflicts. Uh, the adoption of the RMF1 zone amendments will create the right conditions for the development of appropriate housing types, contributing to a spectrum of housing options required for a sustainable and complete community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Powell. I'm gonna go around and see if there are any questions uh, for count from council for you. Councillor Link, any questions for Mr. Powell? Thank you, Mr. Powell. Oh. Councillor Buschetti, any questions for Mr. Powell? No, no questions, thank you. Councillor Prague, any questions for Mr. Powell? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Mr. Powell, the intent of this was four foot side yards, am I correct? Yes, the intent would be four foot side yards with eight feet separation between dwelling units. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kleiber, any questions for Mr. Powell? Mr. Powell, um, you've indicated that if you had a 24 foot lot minimum that you would only have a 16 foot wide building, is that correct? Uh, yes, so with your minimum lot size requirements of 24 feet and your minimum interior side yard at 8 feet, um, that will result in a 16 foot wide lot or 16, five, 16 foot wide dwelling unit. Or the, or the person subdividing could make a bigger lot, right? Yeah, and that's, that's the, the double edged sword. So when you... When or we you could raise the minimums, right? When you when you make the uh, the larger lots, it, it creates uh, some cost implications there for uh, 
for the home buyer. Because mm, we, we created 60 foot lots for bungalow duplexes. So by your um, measurement, then you, you would have a 30 foot lot with a 22 foot wide building. Now, would that be a, a difficult thing? Those are questions better suited for builders. Mm, I agree. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Um, you know, just comments or questions for me. I really appreciate you bringing um, your perspective to council and with um, your company having the background of what the intent was for the original bylaw. I think that helps clarify for council and the community um, that we're not trying to do something new here. We're focused on what the original intent was. Um, I do like your use of the term, you know, no greater functional use um, with greater side yards. So a lot of what we have heard residents say is they're wanting to downsize to, to a side-by-side -side, or they're just getting started and want to have a side, be part of a side-by-side -side for affordability and they're not wanting to look after yards and maintain space. So is that the place to create space or is it best to have more green space in development and knowing that if someone's moving into a bungalow, it might be because of aging, it might be because of disability. Um, so a lot of the comments that I've heard from people are they're specifically moving to a side-by-side -side because they don't want to maintain a lot. It, has that been your experience? Yeah, and it, I mean, if you look at it, it's it's, it's hard to, to do much with a side yard. Um, you know, there's a lot of shade cast there, so it's not like it's a perfect spot for, you know, planting a garden, for example, and uh, it just really adds to the maintenance of the yard in any event, uh, which, you know, some people that are looking to downsize want to uh, perhaps uh, limit the amount of maintenance that they have to get involved in. As an, as an example, I mean, everybody's different. Um, but certainly, you know, from, from the information that I've received from building, uh, from builders, uh, they, they really don't see much value in terms of uh, excessive side yards in terms of their ability to, to meet, meet the needs of the market. Thank you very much. Well, I uh, we want to thank you for coming in and presenting to council. Very much appreciated. My pleasure. Ms. Elias, have we got others registered to speak? We do, Madam Mayor. We have uh, Jackie Wilkie with us this evening, registered in favor. All right. Welcome, Ms. Wilkie. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? With with difficult with difficulty, yes, we can hear you. Oh, let me just uh, see if my mic can increase the volume here. That's better. Is that better? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Miss Elias, um, my presentation. You'll have to show my presentation because we don't have um, access to take control of the screen. So our support for the amendment to the zoning bylaw is in regards to the uh, side yards, as was uh, discussed with others. Um, if you can go to the next page. Currently, as we said, we have um, an eight foot interior and a five foot corner side yard. We've placed um, the draw to show, show this diagrammatically. We've shown it so that you can see what the bungalow condos um, in Park View Point would look like with the five foot uh, corner and an eight foot interior. The yards are shown in the dashed gray line. Uh, the dark lines are the property lines. And then the building footprint you can see um, in the middle with the shared property line. These bungalow condos are the size and quality that we had discussed during the development stage so that they are the um, higher, uh, uh, give sufficient room for people who are downsizing um, and are accessible uh, to this area, which means that you need to have more width so that you're able to build in the accessibility requirements for bathrooms and for doorways and for kitchens. Those take up width. Um, doing it in a linear pattern all in one row would, be, would mean that you would fill up your entire buildable space or more to make, try and make that work. You can also see how there's a disparity um, when you're looking at a corner side yard that's only five feet, there's excess space on that side that um, for one unit where the other would not, would be going over top of it on the interior. So that it's, it, you would not have an even uh, unit when you're looking at a, a side by side unit. 
if you can go to the next slide for me. Also to note is that in the exact, across the street uh, in the development in the RS zone, the side yards are four foot for the interior side yard and five foot for a corner side yard. So we are not going beyond what is uh, the same, what is um, standard for the rest of the development for a single family house, which is a bigger lot and a bigger house. We're looking at this as a, on a, on a uh, side by side unit, which is a smaller dwelling unit um, on a smaller lot. The uh, bungalow condos are a 32 foot wide lot to allow for uh, the two car garage and the bungalow style home. If you can go to the last slide there. This is what the, uh, the same lots would look like with the four foot uh, internal and the eight foot corner. Uh, you can see how the, lot, the, the bungalows were designed to fit to that size with the four foot. Um, and then we allow for the uh, garages at the front um, with the two car garage and the uh, driveways so that we have sufficient parking in the neighborhood as well within the site so that we aren't having extra parking out on the streets that was a concern and providing uh, lots that are manageable for people who are downsizing or people who are coming up into the neighborhood. And that is our short presentation. Great, thank you, Ms. Wilkie. I'm gonna go around the council table and see if there are questions for you. Councillor Buschetti, any questions for Ms. Wilkie? Yes, uh, just that last picture you had up there showing the front yard set back at 15 feet. What, what is the projected right away that you think there will be in that area? I guess you're the one we should be asking because you, you're probably familiar with numbers uh, between the road and what's left from the road to the property line. That one, um, for the ones that I had shown you, they were on a frontage road, so they're fairly small, but on a standard road, there's a, no less than five meters, um, which is, here, let me just do the calculator 15. thing here. 16, a minimum of 16 feet is standard. Um, usually it's 5.25, so it's a little bit more than that. Um, and also on the side yards. Um, and anywhere that a side yard is on a main road, the boulevard is a little bit wider than that, closer to six, so closer to 20 feet. So you're saying roughly the the front drives would be 31 feet. I'm just just roughing the number up just to. As the as a minimum, many of the the um, home builders in this area like to have their uh, lot their units set back just a little bit more than that, so they can get a full um, 18 feet at the front for uh, the longer vehicle. But that again is each home builders. Um, plan that would come forward so that they would have that uh, that uh, done on their own. But what you're saying is minimum 15 feet could be up to 18 plus the right away. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Councillor Clyde, any questions for Ms. Wilkie? No questions. Thank you. Councillor Prague, any questions for Ms. Wilkie? No questions, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Link, any questions for Ms. Wilkie? No, thank you, Ms. Wilkie. Thank you very I guess much. I, I just have one question for you. Um, in terms of the plan that you were talking about in the specific area, that subdivision plan is already approved by council at the 23 foot lots and registered at land titles, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. All right, Miss Elias, do we have? Thank you so much, Miss Wilkie. Thank you. Miss Elias, have we got others registered to speak in support? We have Donna Thordarson available with us this evening. Welcome, Miss Thordarson. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. I had to unmute. 
Uh, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to speak this evening uh, to the bylaw. Um, Pam is going to just uh, show a, a slideshow of the builder's plans that we've received. And the one thing that I wanted to touch on, well, there's a few things, but the one thing, Jackie, thank you very much for doing the specifics. She's the best at the drawings and the setbacks and side yards and the dimensions. Um, what I have received from the builders are the drawings of their homes that they have created to be developed in this subdivision of Parkview Point. You can see the bungalow side-by-sides are gorgeous. We're, we are trying to get that wide expanse to the bungalow to um, just to give that really beautiful look to it with a double-sized garage. Uh, that double-sized garage actually is a 20-foot wide. It gives you an eight foot wide entranceway. So you get a nice large door, side light. Um, so you've got really nice curb appeal that you're looking at. So the quality of the homes uh, for us was very, very important. So the builders were handpicked and selected to be able to satisfy what we believe that when we listened to what the counselors were speaking as to what they wanted to see developed in Park Viewpoint, I think that we really were able to deliver that. Um, the side yards are more of a housekeeping issue in terms of uh, the corner side yard versus the interior, uh, which David Patton had uh, elaborated quite in detail on. Uh, so I think we understand that explicitly. A um, Couple things I wanted to mention is the front setback. Um, right now, the single family has a 20 foot set 20 foot front setback from the property line. That's not including the front approach. And we would like to keep that consistent with our side-by-sides. Uh, we don't want to do a development such as Bridgewater where they have a 15 foot front setback. It's too close to the street. We, we were not looking for that look. Each of the builders have uh, already, it's been discussed, a 20 foot setback is what we would require in terms of our architectural guidelines. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the look of the housing in Parkview Point is very similar to the trails. Um, we have a signature look that we like to maintain. Uh, that goes with our trails, our parks, our lighting, our housing. Uh, and that's why we like to work with builders that we know that we've worked previ previously with, that we know that they will satisfy those architectural guidelines and they will leave a clean subdivision and happy clients. Uh, those builders, they build their homes customized to their purchasers. Um, so I just wanted to make mention that Parkview Point will be built out very similar to the trails and you can all drive through the trails and see that. Um, the homes in Parkview Point, the subdivision was designed based on all of our consultations and we have had several. It was designed to satisfy all demographics. And so not only the single family, but the side-by-side -side units, whether they be a bungalow or a two-story, uh, that was designed to satisfy that demographic so that um, those people that are inquiring in the, in the subdivision uh, had a chance to buy in. So the other thing is um, in the subdivision, we also, we taglined Parkview Point as love where you live. And we will be doing a marketing campaign that will enhance that tagline because who doesn't want to live in wonderful West St. Paul and everything that it has to offer. And with our homes coming, coming into the community and the quality of the homes that are going to be delivered, uh, we are hoping for a retail component such as a Costco. Um, that would be a huge cue to the community. And Bill and I have been developing in West St. Paul for many years since River's Edge. We love the community. We love the people involved and we're excited to continue on. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that 
Uh, and I'm going to address the bungalow designs because those lots, those bungalow side-by-side -side lots were designed to be wider to accommodate specifically what council asked. So we have a 64 wide lot, which is separated into 32 feet per side. With that, that allows us a bungalow to be 28 feet wide. It gives you two principal bedrooms with a nice dining room, living room, kitchen area. They're, they're beautifully appointed interiors, or it can give you a three bedroom design. And you also have the option, of course, to develop the lower level. So with the 28 wide home design, it gives you a 20 foot wide garage, which then gives you an eight foot entrance. So to do anything narrower than that is going to take away from that expanse of the bungalow design that everybody wants to see. Um, so the design, the bungalow designs, they will be functional, they will be livable and compatible with the existing housing landscape that the RM is well renowned for. Bungalow duplex designs require a wider footprint to accommodate both common areas and bedrooms on a single floor. Um, so in saying that, I think I've covered off on everything other than we are quite excited with, I know you don't see a whole lot now. I see a lot on paper, but those builders have got to get building so that people can see how beautiful it actually will be created in the end. We will have meandering pathways linking up to the children's playground, access to Sonova Community Center, we're going to have a fabulous timber frame pergola built on the lake. We are getting the final details on that. It's going to be spectacular. We promised you spectacular. That is what we're going to deliver. And, you know, the, the walkways and sidewalks that you can stroll along throughout the community. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Ms. Thorderson. I'm going to go around the council table here and see if there are questions for you. Councillor Prague, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I just don't want to butcher her last name. I'll call her Donna. <laughs> Donna, um, I know Councillor made you guys construct bungalows on these lots. And if you have to go for variances for these lots, what would be the estimated cost? $90,000. For lot? No, uh, in total. Okay, and um, I know during council, we specifically asked for bungalows, am I correct? That is correct. Thank which you, was, Which was a nice element to add. I, I know that's why I asked for that. Thank you. And we do have pictures that Pam can show in the slideshow of the various elevations, which they have been shown. So in case you need to see them again. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Link, any questions? I'm just wondering if you could sort of guesstimate the range of prices that you'll be uh, asking per unit, that the, the developers, the owners will be asking per unit, just a range. I, I cannot do that because we're not the builder, we're the developer. The builders would have to uh, state the price ranges that they're within. I don't know what that is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kleiber. Any questions? No questions. Thank you. Councillor Buschetti, any questions? No, no questions right now. Thank you. Um, really more comments from me. Um, we, you know, Council had asked for a lot of conditions when, when you guys came before us on that development, and we included 18 conditions, I believe, and uh, uh, so it's it, it was a lot of conditions and the bungalow um, element was definitely one of them. Um, and so I'm pleased to see that bungalow 
uh, those bungalows added um, and we'll definitely ask the builders on some value about that because I know there was concerns um, raised from residents that um, not wanting to see cheap housing, um, low cost um, and, and the pictures that you've presented, I know you can't give us a price range, um, but the intent of your development is in no way to have it low cost, cheap housing. Uh, can I make comment to that? Yes, I'm asking that. Yes. So, so that's an, it's an interesting question that would come up. So one of our, in our architectural guidelines, we're very specific on the materials that can be used on the exteriors of these homes. There will be no vinyl siding if that's what somebody is concerned with. Uh, we require stucco, stone, uh, a cement board or a detail board that to be used to give variation to the house plans. So long is past the day of the big uh, cab over plan that's loaded up with stucco on the exterior and no other element to it. We require three exterior elements. So the same with the uh, side by sides, the same requirements that we have for the single family is with the side-by-side -side lots. There's no variation. It, it will look uh, consistent and it will be the same as what we've done in the trails to give you a visual. And, and the reason I asked that question is just based on the side yards, um, that comments that I have been circulating or that we've heard um, our oh, a four foot side yard means you can just cram things in and it's cheap housing. And that's certainly not the intent of, of the development that we want to see from the position of a council table. And as developers, what I'm hearing is that's not what you want to see either. It's not a four foot side yard, so it can be cheap housing. No, absolutely not. And you know, it's interesting. Those side yards are really tough areas because grass does not grow well within a side yard. So they really are used more as a uh, walkthrough than anything. You're not going to do anything in that side yard. Yeah, yeah, and four foot side yards are what has been done in the trail. So that again gives you a visual. I appreciate the clarification. And then in terms of as developers that are doing this all of the time, and, and we talked about the amount of space that this encompasses in West St. Paul. So we are a rural municipality, the multifamily in our municipality um, as our um, acting director of planner mentioned is less than 1% of our municipality. Um, this is being tied in with retail and so we're not going to see resi rural residential butting up against, you had mentioned a Costco or uh, hypothetically any other big retail that would want to come, um, that this is kind of a transition area from where you would have a large big box store area and smaller retail to multifamily areas. Is that the intent? Yeah, I think when, when Bill and I presented many years ago, we always said that entrance coming into West St. Paul needs something majestic to it. It is the entrance. Well, well maybe it's not the actual entrance, but in terms of uh, someone coming into the area, once you pass over the perimeter, you think of that as the entrance into West St. Paul. So to have an anchor tenant at that entrance and have it beautifully landscaped and trees and you've got coffee shops and, um, you know, a shopping uh, boutique type of shopping in, in that area, uh, specifically to satisfy the community, the residents that live in that area. So we've designed the pathways through the trails and Parkview Point to be linked in to that retail component so that it accommodates for that. Great, thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you for the presentation, appreciate that. Any other questions from council? Hearing and seeing none then, I'll thank you, uh, Ms. Thordenson for coming and speaking with us this evening. Thank you very much. Ms. Elias, have we got more registered to speak in support? We do, Madam Mayor, we have Goldie Gooman available on the line. He's registered in favor. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Gooman, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you, Carol. 
Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. So yeah, you know, um, I have, uh, I'm a home builder. I have built uh, these kind of houses before. So uh, since this whole subdivision is passed, I want to support it. There's no point of leaving eight foot side yard if the subdivision is done already. So um, I think that will be wasted of resources. And uh, if someone can get a double car garage and park two cars on a driveway, they won't be able to do it. There will be streets full of cars. So I strongly support it. So I, I to me, uh, being in this business and uh, you know being a home builder, I think uh, it perfectly makes sense. We should uh, have four foot side yards. Uh, you know, I have uh, built in uh, different um, cities. I've never seen it uh, a eight foot side yard of, on a duplex. So, uh, if there is any questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Gooman. Can we have uh, Councillor Kleiber? Do you have any questions? No questions. Thank you. Councillor Prague, any questions? Mr. Gooman, um, you indicated you're a builder. How do you think uh, with these bungalows there, would those bungalows accommodate two car garages? Yes, um, uh, if there is 32 foot lots, you can have a double car garage attached car garage and to me, uh, uh, bungalow, uh, it, uh, you know, statics is one thing, but on the other hand, bungalows makes perfect sense because uh, uh, um, uh, senior citizens, people with the disabilities, you know, they can, uh, the bungalows are perfect for them, even uh, uh, younger families, because I have built bungalow side by sides before. And if there's a single car garage, and uh, you know, sometimes people have issues, is cars parked on the driveways, especially if it's a duplex. And uh, I think with the area, these bungalows make perfect sense. They'll look good and they're more useful. Thank you very much, Mr. Gumman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Buschetti, any questions for Mr. Gumman? Just a question was asked by another councillor, but since this is a builder, I'm gonna ask, what kind of value do you see these bungalow side by side bungalows at? Just a range. I don't need an exact price. Just what kind of price variance are there going to be? I, I think they should be somewhere from three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollars, somewhere close. It's just me. I'm thinking. I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone else. But it's you know if I I'm have just a, bungalow, a number yeah. in my head. I had no clue. So I'm yeah. I'm just curious. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Buschetti? Okay. Councillor nope. Link, any questions? Sorry, thank you. Councillor Link, any questions for Mr. Gooman? No, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gooman. Thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, thank you guys. And I'll turn it back to you, Ms. Elias. Anyone else wanting to speak in support? Uh, we have Jazz Callor. Uh, he's registered in favor, um, and he submitted a, a letter earlier that was sent to council. Um, Welcome, Mr. Keller. I, I don't believe he he was wanting to speak this evening. Okay. I see his name on there. That's why I'm asking. Mr. Keller, are you wanting to speak? Otherwise, we've got your letter. That's no problem. Just want to make sure we don't overlook anybody that wants to speak. I'm going to take that as a no. Haven't haven't heard from them, Mr. Keller. Are you Keller? Are you wanting to speak? Uh, sorry, Mayor. I was uh, with my kids. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to speak, but I've written a letter. Uh, okay. for, for Thank you. Council received your letter. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Elias, I'll turn it back to you. Anyone else wanting to speak in support? No one else indicated they wanted to speak uh, during the council meeting, but we did get a number of letters in, in favor. Um, we have Jeff Johnner, um, Jason Jackhead, Aaron Komak, 
Tom and Mar, sorry, not Tom and Marlene. Uh, we have Ajab Punya, Baldev Betty, Gurjet Malhi, Simrat Mal Malhi, Pradeep Singh, Jaswinder Upal, Inderpreet Kalan, Karen Veer Sindhu, Jagdeep Pada, JP Shahal, Akash, uh, Akash Guman. Uh, we also have Matthew Yan registered in support, Dave, David Wooden, Tony Ballas, Warren Greenspoon, John Powell, Tony Texera, Akash Betty, uh, and those are, uh, we also have Ben McGilvery, my apologies. Okay, thank you. If those are all registered for in support, we can go to those registered in opposition. In opposition, we have Henry Backer, and he's with us this evening. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Backer. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you for joining us. Terrific, thank you very much. I can proceed? Yes. Yep, go ahead. Um, Her Worship Mayor Christian, uh, Councillors Link, Kleiber, Vucetti, and Prague, Mr. Olenek, and Mr. Patton, Ms. Ferguson, and uh, administration staff. I think I got everybody. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak at this meeting. Uh, my name is Henry Backer. I reside at 142 River Springs Drive in West St. Paul. And I'm in opposition to this uh, zoning bylaw amendment. Um, I'm wondering if, I, before we start, if I could uh, ask Ms. Elias uh, uh, how many people uh, are in opposition uh, to this zoning bylaw amendment? We've received uh, letters against from. Uh, let's see, we've received 113 letters against. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to make the, a point that uh, none of these people were coerced or pressured. Rather, they were simply informed and afforded an opportunity to be heard. Uh, personally, I am an op opposed to this zoning bylaw amendment. I'm specifically opposed to the portion of this bylaw amendment that changes the interior side yard dimensions from eight feet to four feet for RMF one dwellings as per table 14 of section 6.3. This change will substantially increase the density of new developments within all emerging residential policy areas of the municipality. Um, perhaps if, if I may, I could ask uh, Mr. Patton to uh, call up on the screen, uh, the Middle Church Secondary Plan uh, concept plan number two. And while you're doing that, I'll just continue with my presentation. I'd be much appreciated if you could do that for me. Was that part of the package? Was that part of the package, Mr. Patton, that you have? Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I don't have access to that to share, uh, Mr. Becker. Um, if the intent is to uh, demonstrate where the emerging residential neighborhoods are located, I can certainly uh, bring up a map that illustrates that. That, that is the intent, yes. Should I wait or? No, go ahead, Mr. Backer, and, and the planner will pull that up. Okay. Uh, this bylaw amendment affects side by sides, duplexes, and townhomes. It allows developers to construct duplexes up to 520 square feet larger per unit on a lot that's as small as 2,400 square feet. Um, you can see on this map here um, all the areas that are designated as emerging neighborhood areas. And this zoning of RMF1 is allowed uh, in each one of those, in all those yellow areas. So uh, I don't know if Ms. Elias would happen to have the percentage of area that would be compared to the whole municipality, but I would say that it's quite substantial. And as we said on our notice, it is uh, pretty much all 
uh, undeveloped uh, area um, in in emerging areas and in, in, in sorry in the municipality. Um, I, Mr. Patton, if you could confirm that uh, this zoning is eligible to be uh, applied to uh, all these areas in yellow on the map. So the RMF1 zone is only permitted in areas that are designated emerging residential neighborhoods. So um, you'd only be able to apply to rezone your property to RMF1 if you're within one of these yellow areas, uh, areas on the map. Correct, okay. So that demonstrates the potential uh, of uh, the bylaw amendments that are being considered here. Uh, our quality of life is eroded by the higher development densities resulting from this change. Our views are further obstructed. This change has the potential to affect pretty much all undeveloped land south of Rivercrest. The current eight foot side yard for two family homes is justified because each unit only has one side yard. The smallest combined duplex structure is wider than the smallest permitted single family dwelling by at least four feet. Uh, and these structures are almost always two stories in height due to the size of the lot. These larger structures on very small lots warrant increased side yards so that the view from neighbors in front and behind these structures is not disproportionately obstructed to the point of uh, one of the uh, developers that has spoken uh, about how useless a four foot side yard is because it's so narrow. If they're eight foot side yards, we've actually got 16 feet between buildings and they become areas that could be gardens or um, nice grass lawns, etc. There is a precedent for wider side yards for structures of increased mass in the zoning bylaw. The next dense zoning of RMF2 category requires 25 feet. So there, there is precedent for the larger the structure, the increased side yard requirement. The district planner justifies the amendment by saying the current interior corner side yard dimensions were transposed in error and that typically corner side yard requirements are greater than interior side yard in order to ensure adequate visible sight lines around corners. In my opinion, the district planner is mistaken and doesn't understand the side yard requirements of two family housing districts. Corner side yards have nothing to do about visual sight lines around corners, rather street right of ways typically, which are 66 feet wide, ensure proper sight lines around corners. The City of Winnipeg zoning bylaw does not differentiate interior lots from corner lots in two family zones. Their side yard requirements are the same whether the lot is on a corner or midway on a block. However, they do have different requirements for side yards adjacent to a street when a corner lot backs onto the side of the lot directly behind it. They call this a reverse corner lot. Logically in this configuration, the structure would be set back from the street side. So it doesn't crowd the front yard of the lot behind it. In West St. Paul, developers do not include reverse corner lots in their subdivisions because this configuration is inefficient and unprofitable. So West St. Paul currently Current side yards requires five feet for regular corner lots in RFM1 zone property. It's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If you read from the residents' emails on the past few days, they are not against development. They only request that it does not destroy the rural character. This is possible by achieving a balance between density and preservation of greenways, open areas, active living paths, public views of the river, and streets connecting communities. The military secondary plan affords us the right to all of this. All council has to do is enforce it. With respect to the current zoning bylaw, the fact is that it requires a minimum eight foot side yard for interior lots and five foot side yard for corner lots in an area zoned RMF1. It has 
stated in its require it has as it has stated in its requirements ever since the bylaw was amended to introduce RS RMF1 and RMF2 zoning in May 9th of 2017. This bylaw amendment went through the whole process. It had first reading. The district planner wrote a report. There was a public hearing. There was a second reading and finally a third reading. It is a legal document and it should not be changed unless it is in the best interest of the municipality. I don't see how allowing even denser development is in the best interest of West St. Paul. Res residents have a right to expect certainty, certainty from this bylaw. The requirements have been clear for well over three years. Developers should have relied on it and residents have a right to rely on it. If any council member feels that they need to exercise discretion in this matter, residents have the right to expect preference over developers. We moved here for what it was and what it could be. Irresponsible development was not in our expectations, but, we will be, but it will be our reality long after the developers move on. Mary Christian, you were in attendance at, as a counselor at the third reading of the current zoning bylaw. You abstained from voting, citing that you were not present at the public hearing. However, you had your concerns regarding the introduction of high density zones into emerging neighborhood areas recorded in the meeting minutes. Allow me to quote from the minutes as follows. The minutes state, she has procedural concerns around public consultation. She does not believe there was adequate engagement and consultation with the public on these significant changes to the West St. Paul zoning bylaw, particularly the creation of high density urban sized lots in select areas of West St. Paul. According to the provincial government, as best practice, a municipality should consult with the general public before the required public hearing and seek input from all citizens. The public engagement strategy may utilize newsletters, community kiosks, surveys, open houses, workshops, websites. She does not believe the residents of West St. Paul were, were consulted, provided with detailed information or clarity on how small lots could and should be respected to, should, uh, sorry, should be with respect to the increased density described in the development and the development and the secondary plans. Mayor Christian, at this time, or at that time as a counselor, you had a residence, the residence's interest in mind. Today, having heard from a significant cross section of the residents in this municipality, as mayor, whose interest do you have in mind now? I trust that it is still with the residents. Thank you, and I remain for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Backer. I'll go around the council table and see if there are questions for you. Councillor Link, any questions for Mr. Backer? No, I don't have questions for Mr. Backer. Just thank you, Mr. Backer. Thank you. Councillor Buschetti, any questions for Mr. Backer? Yeah, I guess I'm, I have a couple of questions because I asked about this letter with the planner. So I'm going to ask you, I guess, because you seem to know a lot about what's written in it. So you're showing a lot of these properties that could become RMF1. If you're going to look, I'm going to start with the most southerly property, the Meadowlands. All of that property is already zoned and there's only parts of it that are RMF1. We're going to go to Meadowlands or uh, Park View is our, most of it zoned except for the far west side. Meadowlands is already rezoned. The trails, there's no chance of our RMF1 coming in there. Um, I'm just gonna run through this map here, just so I'm using the same thing. Uh, there was a portion of property, I guess it's just what the developer has showed to residents in the area, that they're going for a multifamily use or a single family use in there. So a lot of this is, it's, it's good information that went out to the residents, but a lot of it might've been put out there on your opinion. That's all that's I'm gonna try I'm not trying to be offensive at all. I hope you understand that. It's just 
I'm trying to just say that there, there was certain things put in your perspective where if people would have had the opportunity to hear the whole package or see the whole package, the way Mr. Patton has explained it, I think it would explain a lot of questions and not gotten everybody up, you know, a lot of people upset about this. So thanks for your time and thanks for your presentation. If I may, may respond, I believe this is a public hearing and the purpose of this hearing is to be able to hear both sides and the residents get to, uh, to learn the whole story that way. So yes, it is my personal opinion and, and I have been, I'm entitled to it. Oh, I'm not saying you aren't, I'm just, the letter that went out was a little bit miss, you know, wasn't str as open as what Mr. Patton had explained to us. So that well, explained it a lot better. Thank you. Councillor Bussetti, I, I didn't have any, uh, I have no access to the knowledge of what developments have, have been approved and to what stage they were. Uh, I question how we're getting uh, bungalows side by side by sides with four foot side yards when the existing uh, zoning bylaw says that they're supposed to have eight foot side yards. How does that work? I'm just questioning what you're looking at. This whole area, every area there, the trails is already a developed to a single family unit. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor um, Kleiber, any questions for Mr. Baxter? Thank you, Mr. Back, uh, Bucker, for actually uh, presenting your uh, your opinions. I think that uh, you represent a lot of the residents from the letters that I've gone through. Um, I would say that, yes, some of these things have already been zoned, but they've been zoned with, with uh, the eight-foot side yards. They haven't been zoned with the four-foot side yards. And I think that, you know, for, in my opinion, um, the developers knew that going in when they went for the zoning. So uh, I echo your concerns about um, reducing those side yards because the lots can be increased. They don't have to go for the minimum. So I understand your perspective and I appreciate you coming to council and providing that uh, your perspective and some of the, and I think you represent some of the re residents as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kleiber. Councillor Prague, any questions for Mr. Backer? No question. Thank you. Well, I, I would also like to thank you, Mr. Backer, for your presentation. I do think it's important to have all different viewpoints and opinions, and that's how we uh, that's how we make decisions, and we value your uh, your input and all residents' input. Um, you direct a couple of questions at me, so I, I would answer those um, in talking about. Um, um, comments that I've made at previous meetings, uh, 2016, when the zoning bylaw was first addressed. And my concerns were very much around public consultations. Uh, my concerns were very much around um, seeking public input, not moving forward without that input. And that especially in areas that are very new and involving multifamily, when our community wasn't familiar with that, yes, I wanted to see some um, significant public consultation. I am very proud to say that um, since this group, uh, this council, myself included, um, were elected two years ago, um, that our public consultation um, has, has exceeded expectations, especially uh, around our strategic planning. Um, so I'm very proud of the public consultation that we've done. And many of those comments that you quoted directly from my abstention on this matter um, were the first things that we addressed. Uh, information is going out in newsletters is what I wanted to see. Um, in terms of open houses, we've asked developers to have open houses. So, you know, there were 44 foot minimum side yard, minimum lot sizes. Um, we're approving 60 foot lots. Um, developers came to us and said they wanted to do two story um, side by sides. We said the residents have told us they want bungalows put in 37 uh, bungalows and make sure that it's accessible, make sure that people with disabilities have access to it. Um, residents talked about costs and frustrations going to Red River planning and now these changes are being made um, to limit variance costs for people on something as simple as an air conditioner. Residents told us they don't want to see a community full of rentals and now we're creating an opportunity that facilitates ownership. Um, residents have said to us that they don't want to see the rural character of West St. Paul diminished and I couldn't agree more. And so, you know, the area that we're looking at for RMF1 is less than 1% of our community. 
Uh, I could not agree with you more, Mr. Becker. We need to maintain the rural feel of our community. The reality is we have these areas, and maybe I'll ask you to pull that up again, Mr. Patton, where these are approved uh, by a previous council, the majority of them, some of them, one of one area is approved by us, um, where there isn't the uncertainty that you're talking about. And I can fully appreciate concerns about uncertainty. And, and I hope that tonight what the planner has presented and the information that residents are hearing really addresses that uncertainty and, and yours, because I, I don't like people feeling what is happening in our community. We create plans for a reason. So, you know, is this going to impact the trails? Those houses are done. Um, that's finished. That's the housing development. Um, the area of meadows, that's done. Um, majority of that's approved by previous council. We know exactly what's going in there. There's a very small RMF area within there. Uh, Park View Point, um, they've, they've changed their plans to accommodate council to hear the feedback that they got from, from residents. There's a very small portion of RMF1 in that. Uh, Balduck uh, is highlighted in here. That multifamily is completed. Um, so there is future and especially by where you're located I can understand the concerns for that um, but to make to have residents feel that our community is somehow going high density and that we're losing the rural feel um, the data doesn't support it you can see the map um, and and this council has a strategic plan that we've heard so um, you know I, I can only reassure residents that what we're looking at before us now and and the strategic plan that we have will guide our decision making in the future um, but in terms of listening to residents and engaging them, absolutely 100%. I want to make sure that we're addressing their concerns. Um, not making this like city, uh, the planner's gone through that, making sure that our multifamily is not a uh, city of Winnipeg uh, multifamily. So I, I absolutely 100% appreciate the concerns that you're raising. I'm glad that you came tonight and presented, and I'm glad residents are having conversations about this. And honestly, the people um, that objected, thank you. Um, you know, we've always wanted community engagement and the fact that there are so many people wanting to step up and speak about what our community looks like um, really is heartwarming to me that we have a truly engaged community. So thank you for your presentation, Mr. Backer. And thank you for your comments. They are reassuring and uh, we're gonna be watching and uh, we look forward to seeing the uh, the uh, strategic development plan that's uh, been developed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Elias, have we got anyone else registered um, to speak uh, in opposition? Yes, we have Tony Najian with us this evening. He's registered uh, again. Okay, let's do a sound check. We're good. We can hear you. Welcome to our meeting. Okay, first of all, many thanks to, to yourself and to all the counselors for allowing me to speak. Uh, unlike Mr. Backer, I do not know everybody else who is there, but I will say thank you. Uh, I'm going to put a smile on all your faces. It's been a very long evening and I'm going to be brief, two or three minutes. So uh, let's see those smiles. <laughs> I am what you'd call a relative newbie to West St. Paul, having moved here eight years ago. It has been everything I could have hoped for and more. My only regret is I didn't move here 40 years ago. I wish to go on record as opposing this continued rapid development that we have witnessed in the past few years, especially this amendment to reduce the interior side yard from eight feet to four feet. Most of us moved to West St. Paul to escape the high density of Winnipeg housing which it now appears is happening here. We are seeing large developments with everything from townhouses to single family to apartment blocks. Mr. Pat made many references to it doesn't increase overall density. Um, I don't have a university degree, but if you gain four feet, four feet per side, that equals eight feet per building. Three buildings would allow an extra building on the 24 foot gained. I assume how that eight feet is used is up to the developer. Uh, I believe it was also stated that there are currently six RMF1 zones. I also believe it was stated that more could apply for this classification. So while it is currently less than 1%, that could increase. We are setting precedent here. Minimum lot size is 24 feet. That is minimum. 
developers could increase lot size. Let's leave the 24 foot lots and four foot side yards in Winnipeg. My final thought, uh, yep, here we go. Developers could, if they so choose, apply individually for a variance. But we can't go the other way. If we change it to four, we don't make the variance for eight. Thank you. I hope I was brief. Thank you very much. I know it's not easy to present to council. You were great. Thank you. I'm going to go around the council table, see if there's any questions for you. Councillor Link, any questions? No, I have no questions, but I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Buschetti, any questions? No comments. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Councillor Kleiber, any questions? No, thank you. I think you've expressed um, uh, some good points. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Councillor Prague, any questions? Oh, you're you, still on mute. No questions. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you all. I, I want to thank you as well, Tony, for coming to speak to us and uh, and you mentioned you're a newbie to West St. Paul. Thank you for choosing West St. Paul and we want to make sure that you still enjoy living in West St. Paul. Like I say, I wish I'd moved here 40 years ago. <laughs> so do we. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Miss Elias, have we got anyone reg anyone else registered to speak to council in opposition? No one else registered to speak this evening, but we do have a number of people who submitted um, letters uh, against the application. Um, we have Michael Perilli, Lee McDonald, Michael Coates, Carrie Caldwell, Marissa Coates, Maya Coates, Mark and Misha Kerbelno, Carla, Caitlin, and Curtis Link. Frank, Sherry, Jordan, Giancola, Mary Profeta Toker and Lou Profeta, Haley Moose and Reed Lilies, Larry, Larry and Marilyn Petruska, Harv and Donnie, Donna Mock, Jack and Valerie Musgrove, Paul Adams, Gloria and Glenn Heft, Paul Robbins and Colleen Kachula. Darren Saf Safchi, Dana Shafchi, Allison Ritchie, Elaine Bay, Jay Parkinson, Manuel Borges, and Kennedy Gallant, Harvey Dan, Darlene Backhouse, and Peter Allerton, H. Moore, D. E. Verhowski. Uh, we have Mike Bacani, Tom and Marlene Eschuk. Albert and Jenna Drohomerski, Trella Blanco, Michael and Terry Ward, Wayne and Wendy Marks, Kathy Puzio, Kevin, Judy, Alexa, and Kevin Tindall, Alan Grinham, R. Lewandowski, George and Linda Penner, Ihor Patricki, Stephen Park, Russ and Chelsea Johnson, Denise Hudson, Kim Cover, Cohoven, Liz Cooper, Michael Alberg, Greg and Courtney Morris. Uh, we have William and Travis Mowat, Tess Gutierrez, Jennifer Schultz, Ed and Renata Drahowski, Floyd Vermalen. Elf and Kathy Platts, Patricia Leverick, Larry Schultz, Corey and Tammy Follett, Gerald and Diana Duvall, Barbara and Rysgard Golinski, Nick and Amy Johnson, Grant Leverick, Brian Keene and Mar uh, Margaret Keene, Deanne Doney, Jamie and Rob. Linkletter, George Glass, Pete Thiessen, Brandon Leverick, Yvonne and 
Lezak Sarzinski, Justine Matthew Denencourt, Paul Benton, Georgia and Alan Chin, pardon me, Georgina and Alan Chin, Carol Jansen, Linda Brethauer, Jazdeep Rupre, James Fulcher, Diana Durhack, Laura Tatarin, Myron Garland, Eves and Christina Leclerc, Christopher Ward, David Bibby, Lucy Kahalchuk and Terry Began, Sharon and Royce Yackel, Shelley Woodland, Donna Kismuni, Oral Kizayek, Jason Stevenson, Kara McDonald, Chelsea Garland, Corey and Hyasmin Brownson, Caitlin and Frank Gunther, Izzy and Catherine Pfeiffer, Don Blaine, Ernie Clone, Michelle and Chris Kippen, Norma Alberg, Cindy and Daniel Shields, uh, Laura and Iris Brownson, Ron Clan, Brandon Clan, Magdalene, Dzerko Bodnick, Darren Zacharu, Janet Thiessen, Cindy and Zenon Klazozak, Michelle Taylor, Judith Topolinski and Lorne, um, Kyle Small, Les and Lois Walters, Walterson, Joanne Baker, Daniel Shields, Tom Shuchuk, Peter Trujan, um, all of those submitted uh, letters that were provided to council earlier. Um, we also received a, a few letters later on this evening in, uh, in against this application. We have Stan and Sue her, her you probably pronouncing that incorrectly. We also have Carrie and Ron Karenu. And I, I can read those letters for you if you like. Yes, please, sure. So from Valentina Stalky, uh, she submitted a letter stating uh, we just went through, pardon me, that one isn't actually against, that one's for information, uh, from Sue, Sue and Stan, uh, they noted, uh, we would like to register our opposition to these bylaw amendments. We don't think that reducing the side yards to four feet is appropriate. It needs to be kept at eight feet. There is no room to do anything, and it looks like the houses are on top of one another and it devalues the adjoining properties. Thanks for letting us have our opinion count. We also received a letter uh, late this evening from Martin and Darlene. Um, they are registered for information. Sorry, they are opposed. Um, they feel that reducing the size of the building lots goes against the original plans of what West St. Paul should look like. We do not live in the city of Winnipeg. We choose to build here because of the bigger lot sizes. We would like to preserve the original intentions of what West St. Paul is all about. And I, I have one more letter opposed. Uh, from Ron and Carrie, I just moved to West St. Paul to get away from all the infill houses, housing and row housing. Please keep this area natural with lots of green space and beautiful single family dwellings. Please keep West St. Paul beautiful and spacious for all those li that live here now and for future residents. That is why people are drawn to West St. Paul and stay for many years. In addition, we did receive uh, a couple of people for information. One submitted a letter later this evening after the um, 
package of emails were sent out to council. Um, this one's from Valentine Stocky. Um, she says, uh, she says that we just went through both of the letters uh, from concerned residents and the email from West St. Paul regarding the public hearing scheduled for this evening. Although some of the issues seem to be of simple cleaning up words, our greater concern is that the developers we are dealing with are getting used to changing the original agreements. We noticed that in previous meetings, at least one member of council asked if a developer's representative would agree verbally to planting more trees in the future between the property slated for development and the new homes being built at the rear. As expected, the re represented replied that they would. That reminded, reminded us of the old saying, an oral agreement is not worth the paper it is written on. As longtime residents of Rossmore Avenue, we do not want to see our neighborhood turned into an area that resembles a low rent, high transient slum. One of our great fears is that our council is more interested in tax revenue than it is in maintaining the quality of life that may, um, that very many have come to appreciate in West St. Paul. We realize that some decisions are difficult for council, but councilors must remember who put them there and why. Thank you for all of your good work in these trying times and take care. Other than that, we had Danny Sebastian registered for information and that was all that we had received. Thank you, Ms. Elias. And just for anybody watching that had submitted emails and um, both um, in support or in opposition, Ms. Elias simply read out emails that she received uh, in the last minute, at the last minute. All prior emails were sent to council for review earlier today, and that's why all emails are not um, being read out for this evening. So just if anybody is asking why certain ones were read, these are just last minute submissions that were not received by council for review earlier in the day. All right, if that is um, all that we have registered in support opposition and for information, then I will uh, read the resolution to close the public hearing and council can discuss. Be it resolved that council do hereby close the public hearing and resume the regular meeting of council. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Buschetti, seconded by Councillor Link. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Oh, sorry, Councillor Kleiber. In favor. Thanks. Opposed, and that is carried. Thank you. I will read the resolution 5.23 second reading of zoning bylaw 2020-15 P and then we can discuss as a council. Be it resolved that bylaw 2020-15 P being a bylaw of the real municipality to make various text amendments to the RM of West St. Paul zoning bylaw, including amendments related to two family and multifamily dwellings, permitted projections and temporary additional dwellings be read a second time. Can I have a mover please? Moved by Councillor Bruschetti, seconded. Councillor Parag, thank you. And I'll just go around the table. I'm sure we're going to have discussion. I'll start. Councillor Link, um, any any comments for discussion? Sure. I'm I'm just sorry that this came to us in such a big package. Look how long this public hearing took. There was too much together, and I'm sorry. There's parts of this bylaw. If they were separate, I would approve. But there's parts that I feel strongly that I will not approve. Um, I think it's, uh, I don't know why it's funny, but uh, uh, I think it's a little, it's too much, too many things put together. Perhaps, uh, that's all I want to say. Who did you call up? Sorry, I didn't hear. Sorry, I think I called you up. Okay, <laughs> Councilor no, sorry, I just froze out for a second. No, no comments, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Kleiber, any comments for discussion on the bylaw? Well, first I'd like to say like a recorded vote on this second um, bylaw reading. 
Um, I guess the, the thing that I, I have a few concerns. One of them is that this wasn't circulated to our fire department. And because of the uh, side yard is being reduced 50%, um, if we come back for a third reading, I would really like to have their input on that. Uh, the other thing is, there's been a lot of discussion about how we have to make this palpable for the developer. Uh, in other words, they can't do their building unless they get these four foot side yards and the, the buildings are gonna be too small. And I think one of the things that we have, to, or, or one of the things that I'm considering, I don't think, I'm not gonna press my opinion on anybody, but there's two options for me. We either make this side yard smaller and which will make the houses bigger, or we make the, the lots bigger and the houses can be the size that they want with the same, with the existing side yard. So the argument for me to say, well, I need a bigger side yard so I can put a bigger house on it is not necessarily convincing me because I feel that you could also exceed the minimum lot size of 24 feet and still have a nice duplex on that property. So that's sort of my opinion. Uh, I think this four, four foot side yard increases the footprint considerably and will increase the footprint. And I think that's where the residents are coming from when they talk about density issues. Um, the closer the buildings, the bigger the, then the bigger the house becomes bigger. And so the lot is engulfed with building rather than any uh, any lot and i understand that and that's one of my concerns as well um, i'm also concerned that you know when we come to a public hearing that we have almost 130 over 130 people opposed um, that speaks volumes to me that um, residents are paying attention and they're not uh, they're not very happy with uh, that particular amendment. Some of the other amendments are fine. Some of the other amendments I don't have issue with, but that one in particular, uh, I'm concerned about. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cliver. Councillor Prague, any comments for discussion? No, no comment. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think tonight's public hearing was excellent. My my comments. Um, you know, I can appreciate the concerns that residents have brought forward about keeping West St. Paul rural. I, I share those concerns and comments. And, and I think having some accurate information about the impacted areas and the footprint that this, um, the area that this impacts is really valuable information. Um, I too am, am concerned when um, 130, whatever that number is, um, comes forward and raises concerns. Um, but I also like people to be fully informed. And so I know some of those emails were, I'm opposed to high density residential. I don't think houses should be together. And, and, and we're not talking about that. And there was opposition saying, I don't think that, that uh, high density should spread throughout our municipality. Um, I think every member of council at this table agrees with that comment. Um, so having less than 1% of our municipality be an area where there's different housing options um, and recognizing that we are a rural municipality, um, very reasonable. Um, it, you know, these are very challenging decisions that council is asked to make. Um, a lot of these development areas were approved before our time. And how do we want those areas to, you know, it doesn't mean that West St. Paul is, is turning into that and sprawling into high density everywhere. What are we doing in the areas that are already approved? And, you know, we ha we've provided options for people in terms of housing We've done strategic planning. We've listened to what residents have said. Residents have told us they want to see some retail in, in West St. Paul. And how do you have that mix of, of retail and attracting big box stores or small retail where people can buy milk and buy a loaf of bread and have a cup of coffee and, and think that there's going to be five acre lots backed onto that or even one acre lots? So there has to be a balance. And I think that um, the concerns raised by residents in terms of of density spreading throughout our municipality, extremely valid, I share those concerns. Uh, in terms of wanting to make sure that we have 
a very select area where people could um, downsize into a bungalow side by side. Um, I've had phone calls asking, when is that coming? When is it starting? I don't want to cut my grass on a one acre lot anymore, but I don't want to leave West St. Paul. I want to be in a bungalow or I just had hip surgery. How can I have a, a house that's accessible? So, uh, you know, for me, it's trying to listen to all residents and the concerns that are raised. Um, I see the new residents that have moved into some of our so-called high density areas of trails um, and the pride that they take and how happy they are to be there. And I know not everybody in West St. Paul wants to live on a 44 by 100 lot. And I 100% respect that. But there's a place in our community, a small designated area for someone that wants to live on a 44 foot lot. There's an area in our community for somebody that wants to live in a side by side and not worry about cutting grass. And it's a small designated area. Um, and there's space in our community for people that want five acres or one acres and, and hundreds of trees in their backyard. And so I really have pride in our community that we have a space for everybody. Um, we're a rural community and I truly believe that um, in making this decision for to approve this um, is not jeopardizing that in any way, that this is less than 1% of our municipality. Uh, and I see the pride in, in, in people who are living in these. And I'm quite happy that there's a very select area that will address this need. I'm also excited to see some retail coming. And, and what I've heard from residents through strategic planning is they are too. So those are things I'm excited about. Like other council members that have mentioned, um, the other changes are just really important. Residents save money at Red River Planning. It'll be less income for you guys at Red River Planning, but I'm proud to support those so that uh, air conditioners and things that are very straightforward, our residents are not having to pay for that. Um, other things facilitate ownership versus rental. We've heard from many residents that have said, uh, we don't wanna see a whole bunch of rentals. We wanna see ownership. Um, these changes facilitate that and I'm happy about that. Um, I, I do think in other communities, the point's been raised about, you know, just have larger lots and build smaller homes. But in neighboring communities, we don't see that. So we see in East St. Paul country estates and they created larger lots and what came was larger houses on those lots. So I'm not necessarily sure and convinced that if we just say we want to see larger lot sizes and I'm I'm by no means a strong advocate of tiny lot sizes. Um, we, we've made decisions as this council on, on not approving 44 foot lots and moving more towards 60 and, and different sizes. But that creating larger lots, does that actually mean that it is going to be a tiny footprint on there? And, and the evidence from rural municipalities around us, I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing larger homes go up and still take up a large area on those lots. So um, for me, I'm, I'm comfortable and confident that, that um, the concerns that a lot of residents raised with limited information and residents talking to each other, which is great that they're engaged. Um, I'm hoping tonight's presentation really clarifies a lot of uh, misconceptions about what is going on here and, and, and what an approval of this means. I definitely value everybody's opinion. Those are my Mayor, Christian, Mayor Christian, could you clarify a point for me? Sure. Um, you said that this bylaw guarantees ownership versus rental. Where in the bylaw does it does it uh, do that? I'm just wondering. No, I, I I can't I didn't, find that. Yeah, I didn't say that it guarantees ownership. The planner was talking about um, the changes made to um, to the zero clearance side. Uh, zero clearance between side by sides means that they can be sold individually and that that wasn't previously in our bylaw that didn't facilitate ownership. So I'm by right. no means guarantees ownership, but it facilitates that ownership versus rental. And that's been a concern that people have brought forward. Well, I, it, it, it can be either or though, right? Because it just depends what the builder or whoever owns that property decides to do. Yep. But so, if we didn't, so I, we I think we have to be careful to say oh, that right. it, guarantees it we have to kind of it could be either or yes oh i i'm not saying it guarantees it but if we don't make that change that's not an option the ownership is not an option because it, it's not allowing separate titles and that boundary that's created by approving that definitely not a guarantee but it's an option that is not currently available so uh, back to the planner then are um is what okay so i'm a little confused so with an eight foot side yard, 
people aren't allowed to have a separate title? Uh, Mr. I, there's two different amendments um, that are being confused here. Um, so the eight foot side yard uh, becoming a four foot side yard in the RMF one zone, that's a separate uh, amendment. The amendment that, um, that, uh, that I mentioned would facilitate uh, home ownership um, is the amendment that would allow for zero foot side yards um, where there's a shared uh, wall along the property. Right, right. So it's like a row housing, right? Like row housing, exactly. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I sorry for the confusion. I was confused how the four foot side yard re, would would facilitate ownership. Or uh, so. Okay, thank you. So we're talking about the expanse of the bylaw. So thank you very much for that clarification. Yep. Great. All right. If there's no further comments from council, I have a mover and a seconder and a request for a recorded vote. I will call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Opposed. And that is carried. And now, um, as the planner had mentioned, there's over 25 objections, so that will go to Red River Planning for an appeal. Anyway, all right. Thank you, Mr. Planner, for guiding us through the two items tonight. Very much appreciated. Um, lots of changes, and you did an excellent job guiding us and our community through that. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Well. So we are at um, 9.37 here. I think we should take a 15 minute break, but uh, before we do, um, I'm going to ask for a resolution to extend our meeting until 10.30. Can I have a mover? Councillor Prague, seconder, Councillor Buschetti, any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. I didn't hear from Councillor Kleiber. Okay, we've lost Councillor Kleiber. So we're going to have a, should we reduce it down to 10 minutes? Is everybody okay with that? 10 minutes? Okay, 10 minute break. So we'll come back at 9.50 and we'll carry on with the rest of the meeting. Thank you.
And we are on, Madam Mayor. Great, thank you. Welcome back to anybody who is still watching our meeting for this evening. We are jumping down to item 15.4 um, regarding the fire department's 2020 forecast operating budget surplus. And I'm going to pass that over um, to the CAO and Chief Yakel. Mr. CAO, is there anything that you're wanting to say on this item? And to pass uh, over to... Well, no, we... Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, you're still on mute. Hi, Council. Um, good job there tonight that uh, we've gotten this far in the evening. And uh, we've got Brian Yakel up next. He's, he's doing something similar that what we did with Public Works earlier in the year where we've had some uh, uh, some areas in the fire department under budget and he's asked me that uh, you know if he could allocate funds to uh, another location in his budget and I said well what we can do to be transparent is uh, we could put this in front of council and, and they can decide and I'll let the chief go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Chief Yackel, thank you. Perfect, I'll try and be as brief as possible. You have a uh, report in front of you regards, um, basically due to the uh, COVID um, restrictions that have been put in place, um, we have seen a decline in our uh, emergency responses, um, primarily based on the changes to our medical response. That in addition to uh, limiting um, training sessions uh, to where it was deemed appropriate and uh, required, uh, we are currently looking at a, um, a substantial uh, operating surplus uh, coming at the end of the year. On page two, I gave you sort of some breakdowns of you know, where we sort of, where we stand currently and with some estimated values of some outstanding uh, items that were uh, to come uh, for prior to the end of the year. Uh, I would like to note that the uh, third item there, estimated November payroll, I, I estimated it at 30,000. Unfortunately, when I did the report, uh, uh, Ashley and their staff hadn't quite finished tabulating all our November payroll, so I based it on some previous months prior. And uh, that number now has come back at approximately 21,000. So um, our projected budget um, uh, year end surplus uh, would raise up to all nearly basically $60,000 from the 5725 that uh, had estimated prior to this. That being said, uh, looking at that potential surplus of uh, now uh, estimated in the, in the neighborhood of 60,000. Um, we are proposing for today uh, or tonight for you folks is that uh, uh, in during our capital budget process and proposal at, for 2020, uh, we had um, uh, requested five additional SCBA units. A little bit of history there is uh, 2019, we com uh, commenced a uh, replacement program for all our uh, aging and aging SCBA units, which we currently have 14 of them currently. Four of them have been upgraded to the newer models, uh, leaving 10 outstanding. Um, when we budget was made and presented, uh, you know, we were just at the cusp or the beginning of COVID-19 uh, uh, hitting uh, Canada and uh, the, uh, you know, the uncertain future of what COVID would bring. And, if, you know, I understand, you know, council uh, obviously had some concerns and uh, unfortunately the five units that we had requested at the uh, in our 2020 capital budget uh, were unfortunately removed. That and also the, the, uh, the uh, requirement of purchasing new uh, P25 provincial radios uh, that, for the system that uh, has come into play and has actually have just come online uh, now replacing the provincial fleet net system. So council was facing that uh, purchase of those items plus the uncertainty future. And uh, I understand that the uh, SCB units were removed from our budget. Uh, so here we are uh, nearing the end of the 2020. And like I've said, we've identified a, a, a substantial or potential for substantial uh, operating surplus. So we are proposing that if we could put those items back on uh, and allow them to purchase at the end of this year, or by, prior to the end of this year, it's gonna to help to uh, lessen the impact of future budgets. 
Um, uh, we're not going to, you know, this being said, I still have five units outstanding that I want to replace and I'm going to come back uh, in 2021 uh, looking for either these, these five or the remaining five. But um, either way, uh, if we use the surplus now, we are going to lessen the impact of future capital budgets uh, for the department and potentially, uh, you know, lessen the budget impacts of the whole RM or give us the ability to reallocate some funds to some other areas. Thank you, Chief Yakko. I appreciate you coming in and explaining your report to Council. I'm going to see if there's any questions for you. Councillor Link, any questions for Chief Yakko? No. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, and it's very good to see that you've estimated um, the amount that you're going to need before the end of, of the budget year. Um, I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bichetti, any questions for Chief Yackel or comments? Uh, uh, no, thanks for the report, Mr. Chief, and uh, keep it up. Thank you, Councillor Kleiber. Any questions or comments for Chief Yackel? Uh, Mr. Yackel, thanks for the report. So I just did a little bit of quick calculation while you were giving your presentation. And you'll still have an excess of $23,000 by my calculations. So I'm just wondering if you want to up the CBA unit request to add a couple more. There's $7,500 per unit, correct? Correct. That's what we would, that's what we're budgeting for. And I, I didn't want to seem overzealous. Um, but, um, <laughs> well, you're going to we ask us anyways, right? <laughs> yeah. You're right. We, we there's we want to do ten. We have ten remaining, and we want eventually the goal is to get all those ten upgraded. Well, if if council is uh, willing to um, entertain, maybe we could add a couple more and make it seven. Uh, I don't know if we can do that, and I guess the mayor will tell us whether or not we can do that or the administration. But you might as well use up your money, and then uh, and then. Uh, ask for whatever you need to next year. That's sort of my thinking, but uh, that's just my opinion. And perhaps uh, perhaps we can have people weigh in on that. But you would be, uh, you would be positive towards that, I assume? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. I'll just follow up uh, with our CAO on that and, and, and see if that's any issue from that end. I'm not sure that any counselors have concerns of that, if that's not money that's going to be allocated for something else. Mr. CAO, do you want to weigh in on that? No, I think that maybe we could uh, we could uh, give the okay to go ahead with this uh, tonight for the for the extra units. And then I could just check in with Ryan and we could uh, make a decision. I would like to be a little bit conservative on this. I, I wouldn't want to be cutting it close, but uh, uh, we could uh, 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 make sure that the budget is going to be good. And if you wanted to add a couple of additional uh, units, fine, yeah. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Councilor Prague, any, any comments, questions for the Chief? Report, Chief, that's how you would keep my guess. Uh, thanks for thinking ahead and moving forward and uh, putting the money, the excess funds in good use. And if we can have more units with that money, then let's go ahead with it. And thank you again for thinking ahead. Thank you. I, I agree um, with the councillors. I think it's great. Your um, information to council was great. Makes it easy for us to make a decision. Um, coming in under budget, it's COVID related, but um, there's safety concerns um, here and having additional tanks, I think that's great. So if, if council is willing, we would, um, read the resolution and approve that and have a follow-up with the CAO regarding it just to make sure that they review um, the information and that can come back to council for additional tanks. Would that be something council is willing to do? Councillor Link, go ahead. You're still on mute. Could we not go ahead uh, with the resolution? Uh, if, if, if the units are around 7,500 uh, that puts them at about 52,500 plus taxes. Why don't we make the resolution for that? 
and just get it over with. I'm agreed. Uh, I'm fully uh, agreeable to the extra two units. So I guess just a question for Chief Yackel, do you anticipate any other costs coming your way between within your budget? No, and I and I didn't speak to this point also that um, uh, with it being December 10th today, we've only re this today we received our first uh, in emergency incident for December. So our my potential estimated December payroll, uh, you know, might be, you know, could be uh, over a little overzealous also we know that can change and we could have some major incidents but um, I'm uh, really confident on the numbers uh, that are before you um, especially with the re reduction from our November payroll and what December has started out to look like okay so barring no emergencies major emergencies we're still going to be under budget absolutely okay and if it's major emergencies, we're coming to you to pay for it, Mrs. Chief Yackel. <laughs> sure, put it on my taxes. If you're that confident. <laughs> okay. Any um, tanks would that be for adding to the resolution then? I'm just looking at the resolution. So the resolution reads. I believe that would be an update from, from five to seven um, SCB 8s Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Everyone okay that I read that resolution? To up the update from five to seven? Yes, I'm okay. Could I make a Go ahead. Uh, uh, could we add at a cost of approximately 52,500 plus taxes? Then we've got a figure. It's there, it's approximate. I don't have a concern with that. Anybody have a concern with that? If it's off, we have to go change this again if we just say no, seven it's approximate it's approximate <clears throat> i don't have an issue either way i i'm a bit hesitant to put an amount just in case the amount changes and it has to come back to council for another resolution i think that we can safely leave this with the ceo and fire chief that it's um you know we're approving it based on the admin report if anything has changed in terms of numbers this has to come back to us um, get a report then if it does change so we're adding seven we're adding seven new scbas um so we've been provided a cost on that so they're moving forward based on the cost provided if there's anything different that would come to us i'm hesitant to put a number and then that number be slightly off by a little bit and then that have to come back to us because we didn't approve the exact number well, okay, that's what approximate means so but that's fine Mr. CEO, go ahead. Why don't we just put the this at uh, these the seven units in there and and uh, you know the chief and I will look to make sure that it's within uh, the budget dollars that they have. More about the getting the seven units than and uh, you know nailing down the cost. And if we're going to put approximate, what's the point of of uh, throwing in an approximate number? Let's go seven units. The chief and I will keep our eye on it and go from there. I'm good with that. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. Okay, good. I'll read the resolution. Be it resolved that the Council of the Real Municipality of West St. Paul authorizes the fire chief to use 2020 projected operating budget surplus to purchase seven new SCBAs. Please. Moved by Councillor Pregg, seconded by Councillor Buschetti. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, uh, I will call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed, and that is carried. Thank you, Chief Yackel. You've got seven now. I just have a question for you, Chief. <laughs> sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, that's completely unexpected, so that's awesome. Go ahead. Uh, from Ryan, Go ahead. Some of your boys were over at my neighbor's. Yes, sir. Uh, and the the neighbor had nothing but compliments for your boys and he dropped off an envelope at the rm in the slot there for you guys yes i have received it and it was a very uh, uh nice uh card uh and he was uh, like you said uh, very appreciative and uh, it also included a donation so um 
I um, intend on speaking with the CEO on uh, regards on what we to do with that because that's um, something we normally don't see. So it oh. was a uh, very, very uh, welcome or very, very unexpected, and uh, we're just like we do every time. We're we're just here to help. So both him and his wife. They phoned the next day. I phoned the next day to see how he was doing, and they had nothing but accolades for you guys. You guys and the guys are from the ambulance service. And I just want you to extend that to the boys for me. Thank you. And uh, yes, definitely we'll uh, read out the card uh, to, the, to the entire membership uh, this Monday night. Thank you, Wonderful. Ryan. Wonderful. Thank you, Chief Fiacco. Thank you all. Have a great night. You too. All right, we're going to jump back up to 7.1, regular meeting uh, confirmation of our meeting minutes regular meeting of November 26th. Be it resolved that the meeting, the minutes of the regular meeting of council held on November 26, 2020 be approved. Can I have a mover please? Moved by Councillor Prague, seconded Councillor Link. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed, that is carried. We are down to the accounts be it resolved that the vouchers 41547 to 41619 as listed and totaling $685,620.33 an October visa payment totaling $11,094.23 and visa credit of $805 be approved as presented. Can I have a mover please? Moved by Councillor Prague, seconded. Councillor Buschetti. Hearing and seeing none, oh, I will. I have, um, Mayor Christian. Yep, go ahead. Um, I emailed the um, um, administration earlier on this, but I haven't uh, received an answer on it. The item for one hundred and seventy-four thousand dollars. It um, is that a capital uh, asset? I'm not Is sure. it part of our budget? I know it must sure. be a capital asset. I'm just wondering if it's part of the budget. Did we budget for that item? Is that for the, the truck? Is that for the truck, Councillor Clyburn? Yeah, for the big truck there. Yes, yep. That was approved at okay. budget, absolutely. Okay, so it was, just, it was just bought late in the year then. Well, what happened is if- You're not on, sorry. What happened that was uh, that was on our budget table one year and we only budgeted one hundred and ten thousand dollars or one hundred thousand dollars and it came in at one hundred and sixty. It came, uh, I think, approximately one hundred and sixty or one hundred sixty five thousand. It came back to us and uh, and and this year council said, yeah, let's let's spend the money. It takes quite a while for that uh, that vehicle to get done because you had to buy a a chassis and then it's got a crane on it and, and things like this. And it's in as a, a capital asset. Uh, so we had a question that we were over budget, but we weren't, we had, uh, we, when we budget, we don't budget for the GST, but we have to pay it when we pay the bill. And then we recover yeah. the, the GST, the municipalities don't have to pay GST on purchases like this. And uh, right. yeah, so it's a, it's a, an asset from the capital budget that was budgeted in the capital budget, but a portion of it wasn't. There was a portion, uh, I think, just under two thousand dollars. I don't have it in front of me. That were safety uh, features that they they wanted. So uh, one was a less slippery surface surface on on the running boards, and I think the other thing was uh, some extra duty swivel rings, and that they bought that out of their their uh, current operating. Okay, so uh, when you when we see the payment register, it's it's uh, it's including every. It, we're not getting the it, the GST isn't in and out anyways, right? Yeah, yeah. So, oh, but yeah. what you'll so see this is this is including all of our GST as well when we see these budget items. But then we we get the input yep. tax credit from that, right? Yeah, you get it back, and and uh, and you'll see that sometimes you'll see on a, a check that that you know. Oops. Oops. Maybe like camouflage or a mirage where you see this amount and you say that's not the amount. But 
you know, there may be more than, than uh, one purchase on that check. Right? So uh, okay. you may okay. purchase something and it would have been three different purchases, but it all goes on one check. And in this case, there was a couple of operating budget purchases that, you know, safety concerns that the, uh, the crew said, you know, we, we think we should get this. They had money in their budget and they bought it and then they both went on, on you know, on the one check. It, yeah. it happens with, uh, uh, you know, with other purchases we do. Okay. Uh, you often and, see and that with Stantec, right? Where, where, where uh, you'll see an amount to go with what's going on there, but it's for lot rating, rating, it's for some other engineering surface. It would be there for, be there for, for um, a, a developer. You, 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 we, we pay Stantec for work they do on a developer, and then we recover it back from the developer after writing. The developer. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the explanation. Councillor Link, go ahead. Yes, I appreciate hearing the explanation as well, because it looked like it looked like it was over budget because I checked into the budget. I didn't know about the GST there. Good. Are you going to answer that second question that I sent in or no? I'm not asking for now. Not, 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 no, as is, uh, as you can imagine, I was full blast. We had this is our second meeting of the week. Uh, you know, tonight was a contentious, busy night. Yes. And, okay. uh, you know, we have a number of other things as we get into year end. So it's been well, busy times. Well, I thought I'm the question on uh, the Councillor Link was was a really good question. And I, I didn't mind answering that all. I've got a couple of questions to ask on the or answer on the check register that I'll be working on in the next couple of days. Uh, just having a chance for, a, you know, breath of relief uh, uh, tomorrow sometimes that I'll get out of. Sure, we all need a breath of relief. I appreciate that. I'll look forward to the answer to the second question in the future. Thanks. All right, I've got a mover and a seconder. If there's no further questions. I'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Sorry, Councillor Kleiber. I'll wait for in you. favor. Thank you. And nobody opposed, and that is carried. Thank you. We are down to the CAO reports, and I will read the resolution and then we can just see if there's any questions. Be it resolved that the Council of the Rural Municipality of West St. Paul accept the CAO report. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Pregg, seconded. Councillor Bruschetti, any comments on the CAO November report, the Council November report, or the Animal Control Remember? Um, I just wanted to ask a question, um, or I just want to make a comment. You're cutting in and out. Just is that is everybody experiencing that, or is it just me? A little bit, yeah, it's happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, the one I had a question, just the one item I had a question on for the CAO was I see on your report. Oh, this is the MLO Indemnity Bylaw in Progress Re Review in Progress. Um, is that something that we're, is there a reason for that? Or is that, yes. I thought that we had already passed the indemnity bylaw a while ago and we'd put in everything that we wanted in there. So is there yes. something that needs to be shared with us? Uh, no, this was brought forward uh, at um, council's request uh, earlier uh, in the year and it was uh, sort of put on hold for now, uh, but we, we don't lose sight of it. Um, so we have the information uh, waiting for when it's meant to be picked up again. Okay, was this in regards to like, um, we were talking about driving places and kilometers and that kind of thing? Is that what it was referring to? Or just overall indemnity. I'd, I'd have to look back to my my notes, Councillor Kleiber, to to see what was at the table at that time. Like um, we said, it was uh, from uh, several months ago. You'll see back on my reports. It's it's been on I think close to a year now. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much, Councillor Link. Go ahead. I think that was uh, uh, there was going to be a look at our surrounding RMs or the RMs in. Uh, Red River PD, their indemnities and how how in how ours compares to theirs. I think that's what I have in my notes as well, Councillor Link. I don't have anything in front of me, but there was going to be a comparison for anybody watching. We are 
among the lowest, if not the lowest, in terms of indemnity for council members in the region. Um, we didn't hardly increase uh, or do anything to our indemnity. So it'll be very interesting when we get to a stage where we can compare to other municipalities. We're aware of some of them, but yeah, the, I'm top priority hasn't been uh, council indemnities. Residents should be happy to know that. So that's been uh, pushed as we deal with important issues. Any other questions, comments on any of the reports? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed, and that is carried. Thank you. We're on item 14.1, miscellaneous correspondence for the month of November. Be it resolved that Council of the Rural Municipality of West St. Paul accept the miscellaneous correspondence for the month of November as information. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Prague, seconded. I'll second something today if you want. There we go. Seconder, Councillor Kleiber. Any discussion on the miscellaneous correspondence attached? Councillor Link? Um, did, did all of the miscellaneous correspondence get into November's report? Uh, because I, I, I did look at St. Clement's minutes and so on, and they did have information about, uh, about the enforcement program that was more detailed than ours. I, uh, I printed it out. Uh, we got a, a verbal report and it didn't have the same detail, of course, as the, as the, um, as the information that came from the province from municipal relations. So I was disappointed that I didn't see it in the, I just want to remark that I was disappointed that I didn't see it in our November correspondence. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Link. Any other comments, questions regarding the miscellaneous correspondence? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? I'm in favor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Opposed, and that is carried. Uh, we have 15.1, our miscellaneous meeting dates. I will read the resolution. Be it resolved that the Council of the Real Municipality of West St. Paul authorize attendance at the following meetings as listed. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Prague, seconded Councillor Buschetti. Any discussion on the miscellaneous meeting dates? Councillor Link, go ahead. I didn't see your video with uh, that you put out, Mayor Christian. I'm sorry. How can I access the November 8th video? I didn't see it that it was online. Um, it was on the website and then uh, the Remembrance Day video. Well, I'm sure it must have been. I didn't see it. I, I saw just uh, the, the write-up. I'd have to look back. I can send you a link. I'd have to look back. We've been okay, doing a lot of videos. Okay, because it wasn't second. included in a, an email blast, hey? Uh, it would have been. Yeah, yeah I can edit it. I, I get all those, and I didn't notice it, so I would Ms. appreciate Paul? it because I'd like to see it. Yeah, absolutely. It was sent out by email blast um, prior to November 11th. Okay. I think it was in a package with... Um, the MP did a video, the MLA did a video, myself, uh, and then um, it included all of the photos and information presented by Bev Bragg and um, our recreation Demera, uh, director, Demera Geddes. Um, can I just ask one question? And, and you know what, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going blind here. But uh, um, we met for... Um, lighting the Christmas lights. Was that in November or December? I, I cannot recall. I can't either. <laughs> was in November. Yeah. Okay. And none of us put in for that. So I don't know what we are going to do with that. Well, we have to I did, but content. I put a, an asterisk if I said if nobody else claims take it off mine. <laughs> Well, we were waiting for the two of you guys, for the three of you. I was going to put it <laughs> in the same thing. And I was waiting for you guys. I didn't want to look like an idiot. 
We weren't out there very long. I didn't submit. And I think we were all just wondering what everybody else was doing. But one of those things, we weren't out very long. I didn't submit. But if it's the will of council that they want to on that, I left it up to council. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I just, I just thought, I just realized that we had gone out there and, and done that. And then I thought, well, I can't remember now if it was November or December. So, uh, I mean, it's up to you guys. Uh, but it's up to the, should we go the, around the table and ask or? Uh, Our, I think so, yes, I think it's a good idea. Our, our CEO is suggesting we, he gives a recommendation and we do it at arm's length. So we're not discussing our own indemnity. Mr. CEO, go ahead. Yeah, I think council, you're right. Usually in a case like this, the, the councils I know in, other RMs have submitted for this, so uh, my recommendation would be to submit. Okay, I guess um, maybe Ms. Uh, Councillor Lincoln give us the date because <laughs> wow. I don't remember the date. Uh, we we can add that in administratively uh, to the to the resolution, councillors, um, fr from your reports. We, we yeah, it was November twenty fifth. We we'll always do it one month before Christmas. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so any, any further discussion on the miscellaneous meetings dates? Hearing and seeing none, I will call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed? And that is carried, thank you. Well, we are at 1024. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable carrying on uh, and so I'm not going to. Um, I if think I we... may, Madam Mayor. Yep. The, the emergency plan has been to council at the committee. Um, so that's something that maybe could be dealt with quickly and other items for uh, tabled. If, if that's the will of council, I don't want to rush people and have anybody feel that they have no comment. So I'm seeing I think we all discussed it already. So we did. If we're okay with that, Councillor Link, are you okay with us? No. Go ahead. I thought that Shelley uh, Napier had said that we need a bylaw to submit, not just a resolution. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, and, and she did include a, uh, a template for a bylaw in her, in her customized package for us. I, I don't know what other people's recollections are about that. I'm, I'm just going to wait on this item then and we're going to add it when we deal with the rest of the meta special meetings so that we can have discussion. I don't want to rush through. Um, because if does, there is points to come up, yeah, let's does just. Any, does discuss. anybody else remember that, or maybe we should check with um, Ms. Napier? Yeah, we'll know. I think we should check to make sure. We'll know before our next meeting, and and then we can we can approve it at the next. Um, we'll plan a special meeting um, for next early next week, yeah. and might be during the day because we have other meetings coming up. So um, we'll send something to council and we'll plan for a meeting to uh, to finish these items up. Can I have sounds a good. Perfect. Can I have a mover to adjourn the meeting? I'll move. Move, move by Councillor Kleiber, seconded Councillor Bruschetti. Any discussion, hearing and seeing none? Call for the question. All those in favor? In favor. Opposed. And that is carried. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. And thank you to everybody who's been joining us and viewing our meeting for this evening. Have a good night. Can I ask, um, am I too loud on my phone, you guys? No, no, it was good. Okay, yeah. okay good. Thanks. All right, thanks. Good night. Good night.